as well, especially if uh, people are unaware of what exactly uh, to be done and what exactly uh, is to be seen. So any degree of traumatic brain injury, so any degree of traumatic brain injury, ranging from scalp laceration to LOC to focal neurological deficits, all can be a head injury. All can be head injury. And, uh, and uh, as uh, the Greek philosopher had once said that uh, no head injury is too big to be despaired and too small to be despised. So uh, as, uh, as, as, as a senior doctor, I'll advise you that never take head injuries uh, uh, lightly uh, and never say that nothing has happened. If you have the slightest of doubt, the threshold should be very low. If you have the slightest of doubt, you take advice of a senior or you do a CT scan or you do you overtreat. I don't mind you overtreat head, head injury because if you lose uh, the small things, that subtle things which uh, are to be noted, the patient can die really. The patient can die. So as I told you, head injuries can be disastrous. And the other thing about head injury is that it affects prime of life. It affects people, young people, uh, people uh, in their 20s and 30s, especially in India with uh, road traffic accidents being very common. And then there are falls and other domestic accidents. But road traffic accidents are the commonest cause of head injury. Any questions still now? Anyone uh, has anything to ask uh, or I'll go move forward? Is it okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So I think you know this thing. So. So what are the causes? Um, it might be a bit boring, but you should know that in India, the most important cause obviously is motor vehicle accidents. If you see uh, head injuries, maybe 30, 40 years back, uh, the commonest causes were falls and assaults and other related injuries. But now motor vehicle accidents are the commonest cause. And uh, you should remember that here, the injury is a high velocity injury. What is important in head injury is uh, what type of injury where there's a high velocity or a low velocity. And motor vehicle accidents are high velocity injuries, which can cause a lot of disruption. And before I go any further, let me tell you that in, when you, whenever you are asked to assess a person of head injury, the first and the foremost thing that is, uh, unlike in other surgical uh, uh, emergencies maybe, that the patient usually cannot give a history. So it's very important for you to take the history from passes by from uh, people who had seen the patient. So the patient can never give history. The patient can never give history in instances because he's uh, unconscious. So I told you motor vehicle accidents, falls, assaults, sports related injuries and fine related injuries are the common cause of head injuries. Okay. Now, why is head injury uh, important or is given so much of a, a significance in society? because the high potential poor outcome. Even today, head injuries have a very poor outcome in many instances. When we see later, when we classify head injuries into mild, moderate, and severe on uh, the Glasgow coma scale, we find that head injuries have a high potential for poor outcome. We've come to know why it is so. Deaths occur at three points in time after injury, immediately after the injury, where you have nothing to do, a massive injury, a massive uh, injury to the brain and the, and, and the brain stem within two hours after injury, that is a golden period, and three weeks after injury. Now, there is a dictum amongst neurosurgeons uh, that if, a, if, you can, if you can survive a patient for at least three weeks, or maybe four weeks with head injury, the patient usually does not die of head injury. He dies of other causes. He dies of things like uh, infection. He dies of things like a deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. He might die of a, a, a chest infection. He may die of uh, bleeding ulcers. So these things are potentially preventable. So as I, I, as I always tell to my students that head injury is something where each and every factor is very important. It is just not enough that you do a brilliant surgery. You do a fantastic, uh, uh, you take out the clot and you do a fantastic surgery. That's only maybe one third of the work done. What is important is to see the minor points Nutrition is a patient having adequate prophylaxis of the lower veins. That's very, very important. These people are immobile. These people cannot move. And there's a very, very high chance of a potentially fatal pulmonary thromboembolism. So that's very important. And that's something which can be prevented. Just you have to be aware of it, that this patient can embolism. Chest physiotherapy is very important because these people are on a ventilator. And it's important that you see that the Chest is not a source of potential infection or atelectasis. Physiotherapy, to keep the limbs mobile. As I tell you that after there's a head injury, what happens is that 
the muscles in the body and everything is fine. It is only the head and the spinal cord which is not working. So you should keep your body in a perfectly fit position so that when the brain starts to come back, it gets a proper muscle, proper tissue to function. If you don't look after these things, if the patient goes into some form of atrophy or contracture in the period when you're treating head injury, even when the patient comes back and tries to move his arms or legs, he might have an atrophy, he might have a contracture. So it's very important to keep the patient mobile. So it's simple measures like doing a regular physiotherapy of the lower limbs and upper limbs, doing a prophylaxis of deep vein thrombosis. Uh, in head injury, obviously, it is better to go on with the mechanical prophylaxis because in many instances, there is blood in the brain. So we don't go for a chemical prophylaxis. So you go for these uh, dead stockings or the pneumatic compression stockings. And simple measures like changing posture of the patient from right to left every one or two hours to prevent a bed sore. And then proper nutrition to see that there's no infection of the urine, there's no infection from the uh, long line or the things that are like the IV. So these are very small things which tilt the favor in favor of you saving a patient or not. As I tell you, you do a brilliant surgery, you do a fantastic surgery, and you don't see all these things when the patient dies. On the contrary, your surgery may not be that great, but you see all the small things, and actually the patient survives. It's all about the small things which ultimately is important for the patient to survive. Is that clear? Are you, are you, can you follow me? I want some yes, response from you. Because yes, then I'm, thinking, I'm just talking to my... <laughs> to my yeah, so there should be some response. There should be some mumbling somewhere so that I know that I'm speaking to people who are listening. Okay. Any okay. questions till now? Any que any questions? You can. You, you are free. We are we are just con we are just discussing. I'm not a teacher in the way. If you have any questions to ask me, you can ask me now. Is that fine? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So you understand that it's very important for the small nitty gritty things in head injury. It's very important. I tell that because we'll go deep into head injury later. But these small things actually make all the difference from you successfully treating a patient or not. As in other, uh, like in other things, here the patient uh, unconscious, it's just like a baby and you have to see every small thing, nutrition, prophylaxis, best prevention, prevention of infection, chest physiotherapy, uh, and everything, even uh, endotracheal uh, and the things, endotracheal uh, suction, and when to do a tracheostomy, I'll go later. So these things are important, along with a proper uh, surgical uh, uh, surgical procedure as, as, as it may warrant in the case of head injury. So types of head injury is uh, you just start from the scalp and you go inside. As I tell you, you start from the scalp and the scalp has five layers as you know. Uh, and uh, it can be an injury in the scalp, which is called a scalp hematoma. And then there can be a skull fracture, which is the, the skull. Uh, we'll go to fractures. The fractures can be various types, but for now, just remember there can be a skull fracture. And then it goes inside. There's a minor head trauma, concussion and post-concussion syndrome. We're here, what happens is exactly, if you do a CT scan with a patient who has a concussion, you don't find anything. It's like the, uh, the head has been shaken really. And the patient was uh, certainly unconscious for some time and then he comes back. So there is no anatomical change in the CT scan. But if you go for a physiological then you can find that there's some disruption in the neurons in the brain. It's called diffuse axon injury. And there's a major head trauma which can cause cerebral contusion and laceration. Till now, remember that if the head injury looks devastating outside, probably the patient's brain is saved. It's very important. It might, he might have a terrible laceration. He might have the eyes blown out and bleeding and the patient is talking. We have seen this. Contrarily, if a patient is absolutely fine, there's no external injury. The whole brunt of the shock has gone inside the brain into the parenchyma and the brain stem, and the patient is deeply unconscious and the prognosis can be dismal. So if you see a head injury patient with very severe lacerations and bleeding, don't get scared. I think that patient has a better chance to live than a patient who has head injury who looks absolutely perfect. The other important thing, please remember if some of you ever become a neurosurgeon or even if you don't become, if there's a skull fracture, I think probably it's good really. We have seen that people have skull fracture, the amount of force which needs to break the skull actually prevents further injury inside the brain. What is important is to prevent injury to the brain parenchyma and the brain stem. You, you have heard of the brain stem? Have you heard of the brain stem? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, the three parts of the brain stem, the midbrain, pons, and medulla, that is the most important part of the human brain. 
the brain stem which controls the reflexes which controls the breathing which controls the reticular activating system and the brain parenchyma which actually is the cortical functions so at this point remember that if there's an injury to the brain stem that is devastating if the injury to the cortex that is also devastating but the injury to the brain stem is more devastating please remember never use two terms uh, loosely one is a persistent vegetative state and the other is a brain stem death anyone knows uh, what is the difference between a persistent vegetative state and a brain stem brain death when you go for organ transplantation anyone is any idea i will tell you yes yes so always remember that whenever we talk of brain death have you heard of brain death people having organ transplantations and brain death have you heard of the word term brain death yes yes sir yes yes brain death means brain stem death okay brain stem death there are six or seven reflexes which are controlled by the brain stem the life giving reflexes and if that is shut the patient dies and it has been seen that if there's a brain stem death the heart is pumping the patient normally dies within two or three and there has never been any any uh, anecdotal or any reason to believe that there has been an exception to this if you do a brain stem death if you do properly if you know the reflexes to be seen and if you qualify the patient to be brain dead it is as good as death and then you can actually go for organ transplantation because uh, the patient is not going to come back what is a persistent vegetative state here the brain stem is functioning the brain stem is functioning the cortex you know the huge cortex and the salsi and jari the person where the cognitive functions and our psyche and the personality and all the motor functions we do if that is injured then the patient is in a persistent vegetative state he is breathing he can be fed he has all his reflexes intact but he doesn't have his personality it's gone he doesn't need he is not in a ventilator he is not branded his organs can't be transplanted he is a living person but he is absolutely he has no cognitive or personality the part of the brain which controls this is the outer parenchyma the salsi and jari the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe and the uh, occipital lobe and the patient cannot speak or he can't shed any emotion but actually he's breathing himself he is swallowing himself he has his pupillary reflexes he has his oculocephalic reflexes all the reflexes are intact so that is what is called a persistent vegetative state a uh, patient can never go for organ transplant there but if a patient is brain dead patient is on a ventilator he is being artificially pumped in oxygen because his respiration stopped his heart is pumping the organs are fine he is going to die within 2 or 3 weeks or 2 or 3 days sorry you are in a position to harvest his organs provided he it, it is good enough and transplant so that is the difference between a brain dead patient and a persistent vegetative disease is that clear to you is that clear Sir. any questions any questions hello so when we when we when we go for a brain brain death uh, brain death please remember there are certain uh, important reflexes which we should know so there are six or seven reflexes which should be uh, absent to confirm a person is brain dead the first and foremost very important is the pupils are fixed and dilated not reacting to light okay the pupils are fixed dilated not reacting to light that is the first reflex that is very important that is a very very ominous reflex the second reflex is hello to... hello hello so sorry interruption this is like sir uh, said so the slides are not changing sir yeah i i, I actually i'm keeping to the head injury point i'm actually speaking on that i will change the slide later i'm just talk, i'm just talking of it okay i'll just talk of it okay, okay. Sir, okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'm, thanks. Just, I'm just telling you about uh, what is uh, what is the brain death here because I'll, I'll I'll come to you later. So basically, uh, the reflex of pupils fixed and dilated, not reacting to light. Ocular cephalic reflex is gone. There is a reflex called the doll sign, which I'll tell you later. Ocular vestibular reflex. So when you pump in water through your ears, then there is a nystagmus. The gag reflex, swallowing reflex is lost. There is no move, movement on painful stimuli. And last is that there is apnea because once the ventilator is cut off the, when the when the carbon dioxide raised in the blood it is a very potent stimulation okay it is a very potent stimulator but even then the patient doesn't breathe so that's called the apnea test positive and then you confirm the patient to be branded anyway 
We'll come to that later. Next slide is, what is a scalp laceration? The most minor type of head trauma scalp is highly vascular. You know how, how many layers are there in the scalp? Anyone has any idea how many layers? Five layers. Five layers, very good. So S, for, S stands for skin, then connective tissue, then aponeuritica, loose paleo tissue, and periosteum. Okay, SCLP. All right. So it's a very vascular part of the uh, head. And uh, here, what we do is that you go for compression and you go for stitches. The stitches that you give on scalp lacerations are usually mattress stitches because uh, if you just give simple stitches, there's a chance that the can, hematoma can increase. So, and scalp lacerations are very prone to infection because of the blood that is collected there. All right. Okay. Now coming to skull fractures. So these are the various skull fractures. A linear skull fracture, as you know, is a, any fracture which is in any particular distance, a long fracture. A depressed skull fracture. Anyone has any idea what is a depressed skull fracture? Anyone has any idea what is a depressed skull fracture? Have you heard the terms depressed skull fracture? Yeah, with the instrument, uh, hammer and... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not about... It can be done with anything, hammer and everything. A depressed skull fracture is when the outer table of one fragment is below the inner table of the other. Please remember this for the rest of your life. When the, the, the bone has two tables, the outer table and the inner table. When the outer table goes below the level of the inner table, other fragment, that is called a depressed fracture. Do you understand what I mean? So if, if, I, if, with a, if there's a blow on the hammer, the outer table of one part goes so deep inside the brain that actually it is at the level of the inner table of the adjoining part of the brain. That's called a depressed skull fracture. Okay, so depressed skull fractures basically uh, are the ones which are taking a lot of uh, energy for the skull to be depressed. And people are remarkably conscious of the depressed skull fracture. People are in fact talking of the depressed skull fracture. And uh, here what we do is that we elevate the depressed segment and try to put it back. Sometimes we cannot, then we just get rid of the depressed segment and then later we put on some artificial mesh in the form of titanium or other uh, calcium products. So that is the way the depressed skull fracture. What's the diastatic skull fracture? Diastatic skull fractures are fractures which happen in the sutures, during the sutures of the brain, the sagittal suture, the parietal suture. You know the sutures in the brain? If there's a fracture there, it's called a diastatic skull fracture. Basal skull fractures are skull fractures which occurs at the base of the brain. You know, the, the brain, the cranium is three fossa, anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and the posterior cranial fossa. And where the brain sits, on the part of the bone where the brain sits, that part, if there's a fracture at that part, it's called a basal skull fracture. We, have, we know the significance of basal skull fractures. That can cause two important significance. It can cause CSF discharge from the nose. You know what is called CSF rhinorrhea. It can cause CSF discharge from the ear. It's called CSF otorrhea. So whenever you find a patient with a head injury, there's some bleeding from the ears, there's a bleeding from the nose, there's some watery discharge. Please keep in mind that the patient might have what is called a basal skull fracture, the skull fracture, the base of the brain. Compound skull fractures, as uh, students of surgery should know, compound skull fractures, you know, are the ones where there is uh, there's a broken break in the skin and the fracture segment is coming out. These parts have to be debrided very quickly. You have to go in for surgery, uh, uh, excise the part of the bone which cannot be put back and uh, sorrow cleaning with hydrogen peroxide and other uh, antiseptics and then you should close it because compound skull fractures are potentially uh, potentially notorious for being a source of infection for inside the brain. It can cause meningitis. A compound elevated skull fracture is similar to a compound skull fracture except for the fact that the fracture segments have all come out and it's sticking out of the bone and a growing skull fracture. Uh, students, uh, are you hearing me? Yes. yes. Sir. Please remember that the growing skull fracture uh, is, a, is a question that might be asked to you in your in your uh, DNB questions. So what is, do you have any idea what is a growing skull fracture? Let me see, what, what is your opinion? What in do you children. think? What, what's, the growing, what's the growing skull fracture? Any idea? You need tips. A pond uh, fracture. No, remember, no, it, as a thing, uh, it is not as simple as a, some, a fracture which is growing. What happens is that sometimes, remember that when there is a fracture 
over the skull and there is tear inside the dura you know the dura is it's torn all right so this pulsation there's a pulsation of the arachnoid and the brain inside the dura and it never allows the fracture segments to heal so there's a fracture below there's a torn in the dura and below the dura there is pulsation of the brain which is sticking out from the dura and prevents the two edges of the skull bones to unite that is called a growing skull fracture and that is very common in children so there is a fracture and there should be a tear in the dura and the dural pulsation prevents the two fracture ends from uniting because there is a brain pulsation which is pulsating between the two fracture ends is that clear so that is called a growing skull fracture there's a short note it can be asked in dnb it can be asked in any of your entrance examinations if you go further it can is something which is to be known a growing skull fracture i repeat again is not a fracture which is growing but a fracture with the underlying dural uh, injury and the arachnoid and the brain pulses through the dura preventing the two edges of the fracture from ever uniting and the fracture rather than uniting it grows further apart and that's called a growing skull fracture and that's very common amongst children all right okay yes sir good so skull fractures is it's very important that uh, uh, location of fracture alters the presentation of the manifestations and facial paralysis do you know which which nerve is the facial nerve amongst the uh, cranial nerves yeah. seventh nerve seventh nerve. and what's the function of the facial nerve facial muscle supply motor yes it, it, it is it is it, it is a muscle of facial expression it is a muscle of facial expression but it has also some special uh, uh, part uh, to muscles of face Uh, taste um, exactly um, taste it has a sensory taste as special uh, not sensory taste to the tongue and it has a, a small uh, twig to the stapedius uh, in the ear so this is the main function of facial nerve so facial nerve is basically muscles of facial expression which includes the orbicularis uh, oris uh, oculi uh, and then the buccinator and the platysma it is a special a special sensation of the taste and it's also a muscle uh, a nerve which supplies the stapedius for uh, it helps in hearing so these are three or four functions of the facial nerve and that nerve can be injured very often in a skull fracture and do you know the type of paralysis the facial nerve will get is it a upper motor neuron or a lower motor neuron what type of fracture uh, skull fracture and uh, facial paralysis would take no. upper motor low motor exactly because it is coming low up motor. from the temporal bone and it will lead to a low motor low motor type of facial injury so in that the whole particular side of the ipsilateral face is affected ipsilateral face is affected you can't look up you can't shrug you can't look up you can't close your eyes properly so when there is inability to close your eyes properly what is that term called do you have any idea what is the term called bell's phenomenon bell's phenomenon it is not bell's phenomena bell's phenomena is a condition where the facial nerve is injured or due to trauma or due to a virus and then whenever you try to close your eyes your eyeball rolls up that is a bell's but if you ask someone to close a person's eyes and then he can't close it properly that is called a lag of thalamus lag of thalamus okay so you 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 ask the patient to squeeze his eyes and you try to raise the eyebrow if the patient's facial nerve is intact he, you won't be able to do it but normally if the patient is not intact is it, it, the uh, eyebrow will be lifted up by your finger or even then sometimes it can't be closed properly and there's a facial ulcers so that is called lag of thalamus in contrast to ptosis ptosis is different it's from the third nerve lag of thalamus is inability to, to close your eyes properly lag of thalamus all right and ptosis is from the third nerve where this drooping of the eyelids that's different that's different conjugate deviation of, of gaze it can cause various conjugate deviation you can see on the right side or the left side and two important signs which is important is called the battle sign and raccoon sign this is the base of the skull fracture so here if you see if you see if can you see can you see the can you see the picture yes sir yes so sir. this is called this is called if you see a patient with a head injury and there's a bruise behind the ear that is called battle sign and that has nothing to do with any battle it is it actually is named after a british surgeon called em battle he found that when the middle cranial fossa is injured and there is bleeding there is what is called this what is called this bleeding inside the posterior part of the ear that's called battle sign 
The other is called raccoon's eye. I have not. I don't have the picture. So, and the raccoon's eyes is like there's grooves all around your eyes, like the animal raccoon, and, and that signifies fracture at the anterior cranial fossa. Okay. And both eyes look like raccoons. Raccoons. So that signifies if you see a patient with raccoon's eyes, it signifies the patient has what is called uh, an anterior cranial fossa injury. And battle signs it signifies a middle cranial fossa injury. So the other thing that I told you is about the CSF leak. And please remember that uh, CSF leak can be very notorious, very, very difficult to treat CSF leak. You know what CSF, you know, uh, where is the CSF formed in the brain? Anyone? Where is it from? Choroid plexus. Choroid plexus. is formed in the choroid plexus and it actually goes inside the ventricles. And via the fourth ventricle to the foramen medindi and lashka, it goes to the basal systems and then ultimately it's reabsorbed in the venous system. That's where the CSF circulates. And now if there's a fracture and there's a ble bleeding from the nose and some water comes out, then you have to know whether it is a CSF knot. And the pathognomonic test, if you have pen and paper, please write it down and never forget them the rest of your life. The pathognomonic test to know whether the fluid that's coming out from your ear or your nose is... CSF is when you find a protein called beta-2 transferrin. Just write it down. Beta-2 trans. It, it will help you all your life. It will come in your, all your entrance. It will come if you want to do uh, further studies in the neuro or any other entrance. The what is the pathognomonic protein found in CSF, which can tell me that this was CSF and not tears. It can well be tears coming out. It can be other fluids. So if I want to know whether it is CSF, the pathognomonic protein that can be measured is called beta-2 transferrin. Is that clear? Beta-2 transferrin, all right? Yes, Hello? Yeah, right, beta-2 transferrin is a pathognomonic protein which comes out in CSF. And if you find that in the fluid that you have collected, then you can be sure that the person is having a CSF leak. A CSF leak is dangerous because it is a direct source of infection inside the brain. It can go inside the ventricles. So you have to stop a CSF leak. Earlier days, we CSF leak excavation into ear, otorrhea, or nose, rhinorrhea, high risk infection, and meningitis. Halo sign is that there's some blood and there is a small halo sign in, in a white tissue paper. That's, but these things are not important anymore. You go for a beta 2 transferring test. If the test is positive, it is CSF. It's not positive, it's not CSF. All right. In Investigations. Before I go to investigations, anyone has any idea what is the Glasgow Coma Scale? Do you, have you heard the yes, word Glasgow Coma Scale? Yes, sir. So, uh, what are the three parameters of a Glasgow Coma yes, Scale? I, the, uh, just one of you. Just one of you. Tell me one of you. The opening, verbal response, and a motor response. Yes. So uh, I, I'll just tell you. I uh, just write it down because I, I I don't know whether I can write it here. Uh, so. It is basically E, V, M. Okay. Have you, can you see it? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I opening has four points. So, E has one, E, two, E, three, E, four. E, four is when a person is oriented to space or time. All right. E, three is when a person is opening his eyes, but not oriented to space or time. E2 is when the person is responding to pain, just opening the eyes. And E1 means there is no response. So the maximum you can get is E4, and the minimum you can get is E1. All right? Sure. Okay. Similarly, the verbal response has five points. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. V5 is a person is speaking rationally. So if someone asks your name, what is your name? My name is such and such. Where are you? I am in maybe here in Calcutta or in Bombay or some other. And this is uh, morning. V4 is a person is speaking. He's speaking. Please recollect the difference between V4 and V5. V4 is a person speaking adequately well, but he's confused. He might be saying that I am in my home or I am in a hospital or I am uh, this is day. But he's speaking correctly. He might be speaking his name correctly. He might be saying his son's name correctly. So he's confused. So that is V4. V3 is very important. He's saying a few words. Specific words he's saying. 
like uh, don't don't uh, don't disturb me don't do this v two is making a few sounds and v one is making nothing so the maximum that can be is v five when he's speaking very relevantly v four he is confused v three few words it should be specific words v two is sounds and v one is so maximum is v five and minimum is v one so a person can have b e one v one or he can be e two v two or he can be e three v two any combination is possible so basically and the last and the most important is the motor response motor response is m one m two m three m four m five m six so you see e has e one two three four V has five and M has six. What is M six? M six is a person is obeying commands. Obeying commands. Please show me your tongue. Please lift your right finger. Please lift your left leg. He is obeying commands. M five is localizing. You try to pinch that person. The person takes his finger and pulls it out. So that is localizing to pain. M four is withdrawal. You try to pinch him. He tries to go away. M three is abnormal flexion, M two is abnormal extension, M one is no response. So the minimum is M one and the maximum is M six. So a person who has E one, V one, and M one, he is Glasgow Coma Scale three, severe head injury. Three to eight is severe head injury. So three to eight is severe head injury. Okay, all right. Second, if a person has a E three V three M five, so how much is this? How much is this? Eleven, isn't it? Is yes, it sir. how much? Yes, sir. Eleven. Eleven. So, so from eight to thirteen, it is moderate head injury. So below eight is below eight is severe. Eight to thirteen is moderate, and fourteen and fifteen is mild head injury. So you can see very well that the Glasgow Coma Scale is very important for you to understand in what state of consciousness. And please remember, the Glasgow Coma Scale is not a test to see your motor or sensory functions. A person can be completely quadriplegic and yet have a motor response of six. We are not testing his motor power. what we are testing is his consciousness his ability for the brain to understand a command and do it it is not we are not seeing whether he is having motor power he can be totally paralyzed from his neck downwards and even if he sticks out his tongue he has a motor response of 6 so this is something which is very often mistaken by students they mistake the motor response as motor power motor power is a different modality motor response is a different modality here you are seeing whether the conscious brain can perform some actions which you want him to do it is not whether he has the ability to perform whether he is paraplegic or quadriplegic is not seen so it is the conscious brain performing a motor act conscious brain performing a verbal act and the conscious brain performing a eye opening so the maximum is 15 as you are i am i and you are all e4 v5 m6 so we are 15 gcs 15 and the minimum is e1 v1 m1 okay and, and the whole gamut of neurosurgery is between this 3 to 15 so it's very important as neurosurgeons or wants to be a doctor first and foremost to go to a patient's bedside and find out what is the coma scale Yes, and you tell to your consultant that I think the patient is E two, he is V three and M four, and so the patient and the doctor he might be sitting somewhere in the other part of the town knows exactly what is the coma scale. So this is important. This important coma score. Hello, is it okay? Are you hearing? Yes, sir. This important coma score, the Glasgow coma score, one of the most important scales ever discovered in modern science. was done by two neurosurgeons and neurologists from glasgow in 1970s by the name of teesdale and jennet so 
after the coma scale it has become mathematically clear that when i say the person is gcs 15 or gcs 13 or gcs 11 you have a fair idea that how bad the head injury is earlier what we said the patient is unconscious the patient is subconscious the patient is comatose patient is obtunded and it was very confusing what is obtunded to me may not be the same to you what do you mean by uh, semi conscious may be different to what you say and what i think so this is a mathematical but when you say that the patient has a coma scale of 10 you know well well exactly it's something like this if if someone says a coma scale of 8 you know it's a severe head injury so there's no there's no uh, what i want to say there's no uh, uh, this uh, confusion in trying to know how bad the head injury that's very important that we go to the bedside of the patient and do the coma scale first and the other things that is important is the x-ray i say that even before you do a ct scan go for x-ray in head injury always remember a simple x-ray skull is important to see whether there is a fracture of the skull and always do x-ray of the cervical spine x-ray of the chest x-ray of the pelvis usg whole abdomen echocardiogram so it's very important so when you see a patient who is glasgow coma scale of 7 you do a x-ray hello yes sir can you hear me? me yes sir yeah so always do an x ray of the cervical spine never ever forget to do x ray of cervical spine do a ct scan because 10% of people with head injury have severe hello hello sir not audible hello hello yes sir can you hear me yes sir yes sir sorry hello you can hear me eh? is it clear yes sir yes sir yeah i think there was some uh, something so we have come so always remember that whenever you do the investigations as i tell you do an x ray of the cervical spine a chest a pelvis usg whole abdomen and Uh, eco cardiograph because these things can be you you in 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 the management of head injury you might miss it you might miss a splenic rupture you might miss a long bone fracture you might miss a cardiac uh, uh, bruise so always do these uh, along with a ct scan the ct scan is a standard modality so whenever you go for a head injury the one and the most important thing is a ct scan and when you do a ct scan you must remember that in head injury it is not the mri but the ct scan that is more helpful okay so it is not the mri but the ct scan that is more helpful because the ct scan gives a far better picture for head injuries and mri gives a picture better in brain infarctions and brain tumors so go for a simple ct scan plain do you know what a plain ct scan is we give no contrast you just do a ct scan and you see how bad it is if there is bleeding from the ear or nose in case of suspected csf leak you go for the transferrin test and csf leak as i told you is measured by the beta 2 transferrin all right now pre hospital care so it's very important patients with severe head injury should be assumed to have a cervical spine never forget that whenever you find a patient with severe head injury it is very important that you assume that the patient has a bad cervical spine injury also he might not have you, you, it is nice to be uh, wrong that he never had but you think that he has it never think that the spine is okay it's because uh people have been found to be conscious but paralyzed because he has a back spinal injury and immobilized with until clinical and radiographic studies it can prove otherwise always assume every head injury patient to have a cervical spine injury 
until you prove otherwise. Always assume that. That this guy has a bad cervical spine injury. Minimize CSF leak by patient. Putting the patient blood flat. Never suction orally. Because that can actually, if you do a suction orally, it can actually go inside the brain through the uh, uh, fracture inside the brain. Because there is a fracture at the base of the skull. And the other thing that is important is the measures to reduce ICP. I'll tell you supportive management and surgery. So the whole idea of neurosurgery is to lower the intracranial pressure. So minor head trauma has a toll, a concussion, head injury with a temporary loss of brain function. Concussion can cause a variety of physical, cognitive, and emotional symptoms. Like cause sudden acceleration, deceleration injury, car accidents, sports injury, bicycle accidents. People have very good recovery. Can, are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. People have very good recovery in concussions. You do a CT scan, there's nothing in the CT scan, but the patient has a concussion. That's all a concussion is all about. There is no anatomical uh, damage in the brain, but there's a physiological disruption, uh, which cannot be actually evaluated through any images, but you can evaluate it clinically, and the patient has a good recovery. That's a concussion where there is no bleeding, no contusion, no trauma as such in the brain, which can be seen on MRI or a CT scan. So that's a concussion where the brain has been shaken, Physiologically, there has been some disruptions, but no anatomical disruptions. Now, head injury, the other thing is that types of head injuries are concussion, as I told, physical headache, they can be loss of uh, consciousness, amnesia, and Cushing stride and convulsion. Do you know what the Cushing stride is? Anyone, any idea? Yes, tell me. Who Do you know who was Dr. Cushing? Irregular breathing, radicardia. Hypertension, radicardia. Yes. Hypertension, bradycardia, and respiration. Hypertension, bradycardia, yes, irregular breathing. And there's two. What's the tried for? What's the third thing for? Irregular breathing. Hypertension. Change structure. Hypertension. 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 Hello? Hello? The pressure increases. There's hypertension, there is bradycardia, and there is irregular breathing. This is called a Cushing stride. All right. Cushing stride. Pushing stride. So, Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's okay. Yeah, that's a Cushing stride. So, Cushing was, uh, Dr. Cushing, uh, you'll remember Cushing, he's a very, very famous, he's in fact considered to be the father of neurosurgery. He was an American neurosurgeon, and you have the Cushing stride, and you have the Cushing syndrome, and you have the Cushing ulcer. You have a lot of things named Dr. Cushing. He was a very famous American neurosurgeon. Uh, and the only other person who's equally famous is. Uh, Walter Dandy, you, if, if you go to neurosurgery, you know that. And uh, he is the guy who coined this term Cushing stride. Uh, and this is a sign that the patient's uh, brain pressure is increasing. The patient's uh, uh, respiration gets irregular and he's bradycardic, that is his pulse falls below 60 and uh, there is a high increase of blood pressure. So these were the things which used to be done before the age of CT and MRI where people could not see inside the brain. But nowadays, with, you can see the images and you can put what is called the ICP monitor or a bolt and you can actually measure the pressure and you can do accordingly. So head injury, uh, minor head trauma, post-concussion syndrome, two weeks to two months, persistent headache, lethargy, personality and behavior changes. Uh, these things uh, in minor head trauma, you just need some form of assurance. You don't need anything else. You just need assurance uh, that the patient is fine. Okay. So head injury, uh, major head trauma includes cerebral contusions and lacerations. So it's bleeding inside the brain, and both injuries represent severe trauma to the brain. So remember that what is the difference between a contusion and an and, and a ICA, intracellular bleed? In a contusion, this patchy bleed in the brain with intervening normal neuronal tissue, that's called a contusion. And in an intercerebral bleed, there is blood. There's no intervening brain matter inside. The whole part is filled with blood. That's called the intercerebral hematoma. And if you say there's a contusion, spine patches in the brain of blood with some normal tissue. Is that clear? So that's the difference between a contusion and a ICH. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. The bruising of brain tissue within a focal area that maintains the integrity of the prior matter and electron layers associated with multiple microhemorrhages. This is called a contusion. A laceration involves actual tearing of the brain tissue uh, intracerebral hemorrhage is generally associated with cerebral laceration. So here I find a CT scan uh, on the...
on the left side you find which is called the cerebral contusion if you see the small uh, micro hemorrhages that's called uh, contusion because there's intervening brain and there is also uh, if i point out if i if i point out I just hold on this is the part can you see me these are the parts yes, of the of the other parts of the so there is small uh, brain and there is small uh, whitish part that's called the intervening part if you if you see here there is uh, actually uh, if you see here if you see this the whole part is filled with blood can you see the whole part filled with blood that's yeah. called ich or laceration uh, before that i must uh, if you must have a small idea of a ct scan so you, you, can uh, everyone seeing on the monitor the ct scan yes so if you see the ct scan is measured in hounsfield have you heard the name hounsfield hounsfield yes sir yes, yes sir. so if, if if you see this part this is the hounsfield this is the bone this part is a bone okay this part is a bone and it has a hounsfield of it has a hounsfield of plus 1000 that's called bone this is bone it's absolutely white this part is a bone this is plus 1000 this part is the ventricles you can see i'll show you better scans that is about zero and the air that is seen in the air that is seen inside the sinuses is called minus 1000 so ct scan ranges from plus 1000 which is the bone to to uh, zero in the ventricle and air and this part which is called the brain parenchyma is having hounsfield of 40 so whenever you read a ct scan everything is measured according to whether the thing is hyper dense or iso dense or, or or hypo dense to the brain parent gamma so here can you see this white blot here yes sir can you see the white blot here so this part is actually hyper dense to the brain parent gamma so whenever you see something which is whiter than the brain parent gamma that's hyper dense whenever you see that is blacker that's called hypo dense and whenever something is equal in density it's called iso dense that's the way we read ct scans so when you read ct scan i find a tumor which is hyper dense which is iso dense or which is hypo dense in mri the thing is different you call intensity you call something is hyper intense hypo intense or iso intense the same thing in 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 ct scan whenever you read you say it is in accordance to the brain parenchyma the brain parenchyma is considered to be the standard that anything which is whiter is hyper dense anything which is of the same color grayish it is called iso dense and anything which is darker is called hypo dense is that clear is that clear yes sir good yes sir yes so pathophysiology of head injury there is a term which is called a diffuse axonal injury is it called a di uh, and always remember that whenever you find a ct scan and the patient uh, is unconscious and the ct scan is normal there's no blood in the brain but the patient is deeply unconscious first thing you think is a diffuse axonal injury ami apnar sathe ektu pore kotha bolche ami class niche kotha so whenever you see a ct scan a person brings a ct scan to you and doctor please see the ct scan you find the ct scan is perfectly fine you go to the patient and you find the patient is deeply unconscious you can't relate it there's no bleed in the brain there's nothing that is a diffuse injury the ct scan looks fine and the patient is deeply unconscious then the patient has a diffuse injury what does it mean that the micro level there is micro level tearing of the brain in parenchyma and the neurons which can't be seen anatomically and the patient is deeply unconscious there are various grades of diffuse injury but for students uh, in surgery remember A diffuse injury is a widespread axonal damage occurring after a mild, moderate, or severe traumatic brain injury. Seen in half the case of head injury, process takes approximately twenty-four to twenty-four hours. The CT scan looks remarkably normal, and the patient is remarkably in coma. There's no blood. There's no subdural. There's no ICH. There's no contusion. The patient is deeply unconscious. You think you have a hunch the patient has a diffuse axonal injury. So head injury pathophysiology. What happens is diffuse axonal injury. There's clinical signs, the very low level of consciousness. If you put an ICP monitor, the brain pressure is very high. The patient is decerebrating or decortication, global cerebral edema, and 90% regain consciousness from CVDI. They do regain consciousness, but uh, as I told, there are other grades of it. 
what they do. So again, I come back. A diffuse axon injury is a condition where there's disruption in the brain parenchyma, which cannot be seen in a CT scan. The patient is deeply unconscious. If you put a monitor, the brain pressure is high. The patient is in various forms of posturing and the patient does make a recovery, but obviously with some degree of neuro deficits. Now, coming to this important uh, and very important uh, slide is the intercranial hemorrhage. And the two things you students must know is what is an epidural hematoma and what is a subdural hematoma. Uh, epidural hematoma, as, I, as you can see, if you, if you see here, this is the epidural hematoma. Hematoma, which is on basically uh, between the bone and the dura, epidural. It's called epidural hematoma. So it is basically by when you see a hematoma on the, in the scan, which is biconvex. So one part is the convex part of the underlying skull. The other part is the convex part of the underlying dura and there's a blood there, that is called the epidural hematoma. There is no damage to the brain parenchyma because it is outside the brain. The people are unconscious, but if you do a surgery timely, the patients have a remarkable improvement. This is very important to know that this patient has epidural hematoma. It happens in young people after a road traffic accident or a minor trauma in maybe while playing. The commonest vessel is the middle meningeal artery. And if you can actually do a craniotomy and take out the bone, uh, take out the clot, because there is no injury below the dura, there's no injury inside the brain, the patients make a remarkable recovery. A subdural hematoma is a hematoma which is below the dura. So one part is the dura, the other part is the is the you see the calluses, you see. So it is basically concave or convex. And the subdural hematoma has two varieties. One is acute, where there is bleeding in the brain. Acute subdural hematomas occurs in within three days. Subacute happens between three days to three weeks. And if the hematoma is more than three weeks, it's called a chronic. But the pathophysiology of acute subdural hematoma and chronic are different. Acute subdural hematomas also happen in young people do head injury and the prognosis is quite bad because there's in injury inside the brain parenchyma. In a chronic subdural hematoma, which happens in elderly people because the brain is shrinking and these bridging veins are bursting, uh, it happens in elderly people. Here, uh, the prognosis is better. And the last thing that you see here, the last thing that you see here is that I see intracerebral bleed. Here, the prognosis is worst because part of the brain parenchyma has been destroyed irreversibly and the patient doesn't make a complete recovery. You can take out the clot. Please remember, taking out the clot in neurosurgery is not the option. The most important thing is to prevent further increase in ICP and to prevent a compression of the brainstem. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes. So, epidural hematoma, you should know, the short notes can come as epidural hematoma. The other is subdural hematoma, which can be uh, acute, subacute, and chronic. Acute is a subdural hematoma, which is just three days old. Three days to three weeks is subacute. And beyond three weeks is called a chronic. And the other is the intercerebral bleed, which is bleed inside the brain parenchyma. And the prognosis and the clinical manifestations and the way you manage it is different. But you should at least be knowing, be able to know what is an epidural hematoma, what is a subdural hematoma, and what exactly is a ICH. Okay. So. So, as I told, April hematoma results from bleeding between the dura and the inner surface of the skull. Uh, it, it is a type of traumatic intracranial bleed rarely occurs spontaneously. A neurological emergency bleed is venous or arterial origin, as I told earlier. The next part is April hematoma. Source of bleed is a temporoparietal locus, most likely the middle meningeal artery. So, April hematoma, the commonest artery that is uh, implicated is the middle meningeal artery. Frontal locus, anterior spinal artery, occipital locus is the transverse or sigmoid or sinuses. And what are the clinical features? LOC, lucid interval, and unconsciousness. So whenever you find a patient comes to you in the emergency with history of unconsciousness and the patient then gets better, and then again the patient gets unconscious, that is that the patient is having epidural hematoma. So why is there a LOC? Due to the initial trauma, there's a LOC. And then the patient wakes up 
because the blood is now bleeding in the brain and there's not enough epidural hematoma the, for the patient to be unconscious. And when the bleed is so much, it causes pressure effect inside the brain, the patient gets unconscious. So lucid intervals are very important. It's very important in neurosurgery that the patient had unconsciousness and the patient comes to you and the patient's conscious. Never ask the patient to go away. Observe the patient. Do a CT scan. Tell him that he should be there in hospital for one or two days because if he goes home in a lucid interval, it's likely that he might suffer unconsciousness and even die which could be saved if he was in hospital. So, and there are certain uh, deficits which happen according to the compression of the bed, but lucid interval is very, very, uh, I won't say common, but is a very ominous sign in case of an epidural hematoma. Sublematoma is occurs from bleeding between the dura matter and the arachnoid layer of the meningeal covering of the brain. Source of bleed is the bridging veins, may be caused by an arterial hemorrhage. Much slower to develop into a mass large enough to produce symptoms. Acceleration, deceleration injury uh, is common cause. Other risk factors, elderly people. In elderly people, what happens is that when the brain shrinks and the dura doesn't shrink, the bridging veins between the dura and the brain is torn, is torn because the brain is atrophic. And there's micro in the subgrowth space and it slowly develops. So the pathophysiology of chronic subgrowth hematoma is different in the elderly. The prognosis is quite good because there's not much of brain impact. The slow collection of blood in the subgrowth space and people make a good recovery. But if there is a direct injury to the brain causing a subgrowth hematoma, which happens in young people, the prognosis is much worse. Okay. All right. Yes. Sir. yes. So as I told, subgrowth hematoma, all the number three, acute subgrowth hematoma is within 72 hours, high mortality associated with major direct trauma and shearing. So this happens in young people. There's a lot of blood, it has been injured. Clinical features include headache, fluctuating LOC, loss of consciousness, confusion, dilated fixed pupil, deviated gaze, and CT scan shows a hyperdense. Hyperdense blood in the brain. Subacute is something which happens between, as I told earlier, is occurs within four to 21 days of the injury. Failure to reg regain consciousness may be an indicator. CT scan, shows isodense or hypodense. Why? Because the blood is now getting liquefied. When the blood was clotted, it was hypodense to the brain gamma. As the blood liquefies, it gets more and more iso and hypodense. Chronic subgrowth hematomas are more than three weeks, develops over weeks or months after a seemingly minor head injury. This is very important in case of elderly people, probably from repeat minor bleeds and CT scan is hypodense. The blood is seeping very slowly slowly inside the subgrowth space and it gets uh, liquefied and the color of the subgrowth is hypotent, it's blackish compared to the color of the brain. So acute subgrowth hematoma, prognosis is very bad, subacute, which is better, and the chronic. And please remember that the chronic actually starts as chronic. It is not that all subacutes and acutes become chronic. Some people start as chronic in elderly. You don't get an acute episode. It is basically a chronic subgrowth hematoma where the prognosis is good because here there's no trauma as such, but only because the brain is shrinking and the dura is not shrinking. The bridging veins between the dura and the brain are being torn apart, and there's micro hemorrhages in the subgrowth space which causes a hematoma. Okay. So you see epidural and subgrowth hematoma. You see this epidural hematoma, if you see, uh, as I told you earlier, can you see me? Can you see the picture? Yes, sir. Yeah, see, see, this is the this is the outer part of the this is the bone, and this is the dura. So whenever you see a biconvex blood in the brain, this is an epidural hematoma. Because what is important is that the dura is forming a layer here. Dura is forming a layer here. The bone has a contour, and this is biconvex. Biconvex blood in the brain is an epidural. In a subdural, what's happening? This is the dura and this is the brain point coming. So what happens is that it is a concave or convex. So if you see there's a difference between here, there is this is the dura, and this part is the brain salsi and gyri. So this is something like this. But in the epidural hematoma, because the dura is forming on inner side, it's a smooth layer. So biconvex is epidural, is outside the brain parenchyma, and subdural is inside the dura and inside the brain parenchyma. This is the subdural hematoma. So it is very important that when you see a CT scan, the pictures are similar, the same. This is a subgrowth hematoma, 
because inside the dura, subdural, epidural, outside the dura, it's called epilohematoma. Okay. So uh, I don't want to rush. Uh, if you see the basic differences are, uh, I told you earlier, symptoms are there and Whenever you have a patient with a subdural hematoma or a epidural hematoma, epidural hematomas have an excellent prognosis. I repeat, they are the ones in head injury which have an excellent prognosis because there's no injury to the brain parenchyma. And if timely, uh, if you intervene and do the surgery, then the patient recovers completely. But if you fail to do it timely, and if there is edema and further pushing of the brain and herniation, then the patient can die. So it is an emergency. But if done correctly and timely, has an excellent prognosis. Subdurals are also emergencies. But even if you do it quickly, sometimes the prognosis is not that good because the blood is inside the brain. So, epidural hematomas should be given a lot of importance and you should do the surgery immediately because the patient has a very, very good chance, nearly 100% chance of making an excellent, excellent recovery. So what is a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Subarachnoid hemorrhage is basically hemorrhages inside the brain, inside the uh, arachnoid matter. So these are conditions where there is bleeding of the uh, aneurysms of the brain, traumatic fractures, and from amyloids and blood dyscrasias. So this is a blood inside the brain, uh, inside the brain, inside the layer where the blood vessels are running in the brain. And if there is a bleeding inside the cisterns and in the blood vessel region, that's called a subarachnoid. And whenever you see a subarachnoid bleed, you should think that perhaps the patient might have a trauma or the patient might have bled an aneurysm. And what are the features? Whenever you think of a patient having an aneurysm of the blade, if a patient comes to you and says that, that I have an explosive headache, the worst headache in my life. If a person comes to you and says that I had the worst headache in my life, always think that perhaps he is having a bleeding aneurysm in the brain. I had the worst, as if someone knocked a hammer on my brain. That is a sign that you should take it very seriously. Headaches come in various colors and various hues. But if a person comes to you that last night I had the worst headache in my life, never tell that patient, take some paracetamol and go home. No. You should ask the patient to have a CT scan. Probably send the patient to a neurologist or a neurosurgeon because that might be a sign that he has played an aneurysm. So, take the history of the headache very important. Headache history is important. Explosive or thunderclap headache. Worst headache of my life. Nausea and vomiting decrease LOC or coma. Signs of meningeal irritation. So, never let the headache go home. Give it importance. Whenever you take history of headache, ask how bad was the headache? How did it start? Was it the worst? And how, do you know how, how do you calculate the headache? You say that between uh, 0 to 10, where would you put your headache to? Would you put the headache to 1 or 2? Or would you put the headache to 9 or 10? And most people really understand this, you know. They say, I think, doctor, I'll put the headache at 9 or 10. It was the worst. And if you hear that, give it. As I tell you in medical profession, as all of you are budding surgeons, and maybe you'll go further into other forms of super specialty. Uh, in India, it is not bad to make an overdiagnosis. Maybe you might be criticized, you might be told that you are doing a lot of investigations. But if you underdiagnose and if you miss it, the medical legal implications are very high. So sometimes you do it. You might do a CT scan because uh, I've seen people who say it's a minor headache, doesn't matter, it's a headache, don't worry. No, take the history. If the headache is bad, you do a CT scan. You might be criticized that you overdo, but that's fine. It's better to overtreat than to undertreat and kill a patient. Can you hear me? Sorry. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, there was a question. I think. What was the question? Signs of major irritation. Yes. Signs of major irritation is very important. The most important signs of meningeal irritation is that the patient will be extremely irritable. The patient will be extremely irritable, and the patient will not be able. If you ask the patient to ask to take his chin and try to put it on his uh, in anterior part of the chest, he won't be able to do it. That's a very ominous sign of men meningeal irritation. That if you ask the person to ask, there'll be neck rigidity, he won't be able to. And the other thing is that if you, uh, if you ask him to fold his leg, he will have pain in the neck. Because you know, 
this meningeal irritation the meninges run from the brain all through the spinal cord into uh, down so whenever there is a stretching whenever there is a stretching of the meninges because of the micro blood because of the bleed so whenever you stretch the meninges there is pain in the meningeal nerves so ask the patient to ask chin he won't be able to there will be neck rigidity he won't be able to fold his legs properly he will be confused he will he might have a high fever he might be irritable and if you do a lumbar puncture if you do a lumbar puncture you might find uh, increased wbc increased rbc or infection so meningeal irritation is important what is important is that you uh, take the history ask the patient to put his chin in front of his chest he won't be able to do it which you which we he can do very easily because his neck will be extremely rigid he won't be able to fold his leg properly if he folds it there will be pain in the neck he will be irritable he will be confused he might run a high temperature and if you actually do a lumbar puncture you will find blood or wbc or other infection inside the css okay the third part that is important intracerebral hematoma as a told intracranial hemorrhage is hemorrhage that occurs within the brain tissue itself and uh, intraaxial hemorrhage two main types intracranial hemorrhage is ich extending into the brain parenchyma uh, because of hypertensive vasculopathy and intraventricular hemorrhage ich extending to the ventricles so there might be blood in the brain parenchyma or in the ventricles both are intracranial hematoma and causes are hypertensive vasculopathy which is very common in the elderly ruptured avm trauma and blood disgraces hello can you hear me students hello Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. Sir. Yes, Remember, sir. We can hear you. Any ICH, any any ICH below the age of forty, the commonest cause is an AVM, arteriovenous malformation. Any ICH between forty to sixty, the commonest cause is hypertensive bleed, and any ICH beyond sixty years old is due to uh, amyloidosis. So, if you find ICH below forty, don't think of hypertension first. Think that it could be an arteriovenous malformation, AVM. small artery venous malformation small uh, vascular uh, tumors that are found in the brain and that has bled if the bleeding is between 40 to 60 ich the commonest cause is hypertension and the, if the bleeding is beyond 60 it is due to amyl the blood vessels become very rigid and they tend to bleed so this is a common dictum that below 40 avm 40 to 60 it is an Uh, ICH and beyond uh, 60, it is uh, an. Uh, um, have you heard of the term amyloidosis? Yes, sir. Amyloidosis. Yes, that happens in the brain, and that's the common cause. So the clinical presentations are rapidly progressive severe headache, bending over several minutes, often accompanied by focal neurological deficits, nausea and vomiting, decreased level of consciousness. But see, in a uh, in a the headache is it occurs over minutes but if it is occurs over seconds on the worst headache that is a headache of aneurysm bleed which i told you earlier and it can be in fact bleeding in the basal ganglia cerebellum pons the cerebral cortex and the clinical manifestations could be hemiparesis uh, it could be dysphagia it could be ataxia vertigo cranial nerve deficits coma hemiparesis hemisensory loss and hemianopsia any form of manifestations can occur this is basically what we call the stroke it's called a hemorrhagic stroke a stroke is a condition where there is a limited loss of brain parenchyma leading to a manifestation in the human body so if there is bleeding in the brain that is called a hemorrhagic stroke if there is a uh, infarction in the brain that's called a uh, infarction stroke it's called a thrombotic stroke so it is a form of the stroke of the brain i see it from the stroke so coming to the complications of head injury so neurological deficits or death can occur seizures so you should whenever you manage head injury always give anti epileptic medication because patients are very prone to epilepsy obstructive hydrocephalus the blood in the brain obstructs the ventricles and leads to obstructive hydrocephalus spasticity spasticity is an increase in the muscle tone on relaxation so what is a spastic muscle whenever the tone is increased when you try to release a muscle that is called spasticity and that happens because of the upper motor neuron inhibition when the upper motor neuron lesions are there the inhibitory effect is gone and the tones become very spastic very spastic so spasticity is nothing but when you try to do a passive movement of the arm and you find resistance as called spasticity 
This is because the upper motor neurons, the corticospinal tract, which is normally under inhibition, it keeps everything inhibition. That inhibition is gone due to the head injury, and actually it becomes extremely spastic. The jerks get exaggerated. The biceps jerk and the triceps jerk and knee jerk. All jerks are exaggerated, and the plantar goes up going. That's called the Babinski. Have you heard of the term Babinski sign? Yes, sir. Babinski. These are features of upper motor neuron lesion. The cortical spinal tract keeps everything under check. When that part is destroyed, then it is basically keeps everything under check in an inhibition. When that inhibition is gone, then the jerks exaggerated, the muscles become spastic, and the Babinski goes up. Urinary complications happen because you go for what is called a neurogenic bladder. The bladder is also controlled by the brain and the spinal cord, and then you find various forms of autonomic bladder. You have obstruction, you have retention, you have incontinence, and the overflow incontinence. So the bladder can't empty because the bladder is coordinated with the brain and the spinal cord. And if that can't happen, the bladder becomes autonomic, and the bladder then cannot function properly. So what happens is that there is usual retention. There's obstruction to the flow, and there is sometimes what is called uh, incontinence. Aspiration pneumonia is common in patients with head injuries because the patients can't breathe properly, patients can't swallow properly, and what happens is that you can't cough properly. So you can't cough even if you put the finest speck of water in your throat, you cough out. But here the patient can't cough, and so micro amount of Uh, fluids starts accumulating inside the uh, lungs and you got pneumonia cushing ulcer ulcers named after dr cushing are special ulcers in the stomach which happens due to raised icp and you have ulcers in the stomach whenever there is a raised icp and this ulcers happening that's called cushing ulcer this is very important it has been seen that patients with uh, under stress under raised icp Have ulcers forming inside the alimentary tract, especially in the stomach uh, and the intestines, called pushing ulcer. Neuropathic pain, pain which is neuropathic, is different from pain which is nociceptive. Nociceptive pain is pain where there is an irritation to your surface. And neuropathic pain is when the nerve itself is damaged. When you irritate the nerve endings, you get you get what is called a nociceptive pain. The nerve is fine. That is called a nociceptive pain. And neuropathic pain is pain where there is damage to the brain. classical example is diabetes where the with the nerve is damaged so you can't just deal this patients <clears throat> okay then there is deep vena have you heard of the deep vena thrombosis dv dvt very very important the patients are paralyzed the patient cannot move his legs so what happens is that there's clot forming inside the vena system the deep vena system of our legs and that clot can go into the lungs and cause a fatal pulmonary embolism so in head injury what is important is that you should start what is called mechanical prophylaxis from day 1 you start moving the legs you do a physiotherapy you put on dead stockings it's called thromboembolic deton stockings and you also put a pneumatic compression so that the squeezing action of the muscles in the legs the cuff muscles are there blood is not allowed to accumulate to form a clot and so dislodge and go to the lungs which is very very fatal the pulmonary embolism is a definite uh, uh, sign of concern in head injury patients with patients who are legs are paralyzed and they can't move and we can't go for chemo prophylaxis we can't go for uh, low molecular weight heparin all these things in case of head injuries because that will lead to further bleeding inside the brain so mechanical prophylaxis in the form of stockings in early movement trying to mobilize trying to keep the legs moving is very important or you lose the patient pulmonary embolism and cerebral herniation i'll tell you a bit of cerebral herniation what is herniation brain herniation is a deadly side effect of very high intracranial pressure uh that occurs when a part of the brain is squeezed across structures within the skull brain herniation represents mechanical displacement of normal brain relative to another anatomic region secondary to mass effect from traumatic neoplastic ischemic infarct so if you see these are the a uh, very fundamental uh, example of what cerebral herniation if you see uh, the herniation which is, is uh, the one that is uh, is called uncle herniation so number one is one uncle herniation where this part is called the uncus of the temporal lobe and that herniates between the brain stem i'll tell you this is the brain stem this is the brain stem and this is a part of temporal lobe this is called uncle herniation okay so uh, it's a very uh, uncle herniation 
central transtentorial herniation is the one that is coming down straight. The whole of the supratentorial is going down and is pushing down. This is called tentorial herniation. Three cingulate. Cingulate Single herniation is when one part of the brain hemisphere hernias under the intermediate suspicion and goes to the other side. This is uh, called a cingulate. This is number three. And sometimes what we call, call upward herniation, where the pressure in the posterior process is so high and the pressure in the uh, supratentorial is low, there's herniation of the brainstem going upwards. It's called upward herniation. And the last is the tonsillar herniation. Tonsillar herniation. Tonsillar herniation, sorry, wait. Where there is the whole cerebral tonsils, number six, cerebral tonsils herniates inside the spinal cord. The other one herniation that is found when, it, when we do a flap here, when you do a flap, when you do a brain do a flap here, and th from that bone flap, part of the brain uh, herniates un un inside the skin. That is called a flap herniation. So that's not important, but you should remember that these herniations are important. One is a herniation of the uncus, which is part of the temporal lobe, which herniates between the brainstem, which causes a specific signs. The other is a central herniation, where the whole of the brain, upper brain, herniates through the uh, um, in, in, in brainstem into a tentorial incisiva. And the other is obviously the single herniation, where part of the brain on the left side herniates under on the right. This is a single herniation. Uh, as I told, this is a calvarian herniation is the one where there is an operation, transcalvarian herniation, and upward herniation and tonsil herniation. So these are, I don't I don't think so. You should just know the names of what single herniation. It's the most common type of innermost part of the frontal lobe is scraped under part of the flat cerebri. The dura will mat at the top and it goes down. Here, obviously, if you have any idea of how the brain uh, uh, structure is there, the patient will have a weakness of the legs only because the part that is herniated is the one that com uh, com controls the leg movements. So it's not important. You just remember that single herniation is herniation of one semisphere of the brain to the other side. And uncle herniation is the one that is very deadly, common subtype of cerebral herniation following raised ICP. In most part of the temporal lobe, the uncus can be squeezed so much that it moves towards the tentonium and puts pressure on the brain stem, most notably on the midbrain. And the manifestations are ipsilateral fixed related pupil, compression of the homonymous hemiapia, compression uh, and the hemiparesis of the other side. So I think I'll take another class where uh, you should know that if there is a dilated pupil on one side and weakness on the other and the patient uh, is unconscious, you might think of uh, uncle herniation. So diagnostic studies as I told is a CT scan, uh, GCS score less than 15 after blunt head trauma, uh, warrants a patient with no intoxicating concentration of an urgent CT scan. CT findings as I told, uh, let's re recall, this is the epidural hematoma. You can see it is biconvex, as I told earlier. It's a classical example of uh, epidural hematoma. And this is a uh, subdural hematoma, see? This part is convex and this part is concave or convex. This is important. So uh, for uh, DNB students, this is important that you just can uh, um, differentiate between a subdural epidural. Uh, biconvex epidural, very good prognosis if you do a timely uh, surgery. Subral hematoma, this is an acute subral hematoma because you see the blood is hyperdense compared to the brain parent coming. It's an acute subral hematoma. And there's some blood in the intermus fissure also. Here, obviously, the prognosis is not that good because the brain is also affected. Uh, this is a classical example of subarachnoid. See, these are basically places where the brain uh, blood vessels run and whenever there's bleed. So you see how patchy it is, how patchy. These are uh, what is called basically basal cisterns. This is the interhemispheric cistern. This is the cilvial cistern. This is the bra uh, brain stem. These are called the ambient cisterns. These are cisterns where the where the blood vessels run. And if there's bleeding there, it's called basically what is called uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is interventricular uh, bleed. Blood has burst inside the ventricle. So these four types of bleeds are very important. Let me uh, go back to the previous slide if you just to make it clear. Just to make it clear, so epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid bleed. Just, just remember the pictures. Epidural is this, subdural is this, and subarachnoid and interventricle. So you get a good idea that whenever you see CT scan, you see this blood, because people uh, tend to make a mistake of what is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is subarachnoid. So there's blood actually filtering through the blood vessel, the passage of the vessels. So here the vessels are running, and so you see it's not blood all over is as if it's following a tract. And this tract exactly is the features of a, a, a suburb hemorrhage.
Diagnostic studies are MRI superior for demonstrating the size of an acute cerebral hematoma. But I will tilt the, the cerebral angiogram if hemorrhage is confirmed. Cervical spine extra, as I told earlier, EEG and lumbar puncture. Management, uh, do you want to go to management today or you want to go to management later? Hello? Hello? Sir, please continue. Later. Will I continue? Yes, sir, yes, sir please continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, remember that uh, what is important in the management of hand injuries, as I told that first and foremost, you see what is the Glasgow coma scale. It's very important. And you put the patient in the category of whether the patient has a severe head injury, where the coma scale is below eight, uh, whether the coma scale between nine to 13 is a moderate head injury and above uh, 14 to 15 is a minor head injury. Always remember that a patient who has head injury which is severe, eight or below, warrants an endotracheal intubation immediately. Immediately. It is not because of any other thing, but if a patient is unconscious to the level that he is GCS eight or below, and if you don't actually uh, protect his uh, airway, then the further hypoxia that can happen can cause irreversible damage to the brain. So a patient who is GCS eight needs a intubation. He should be an intubated and put on a ventilator. There's no dictum or there's nothing against it. It is a protocol followed all over the world. So uh, people will ask you that uh, why should why should I uh, intubate a patient is breathing perfectly? You're not breathing. You're not intubating because of the patient is breathing properly. You're intubating to prevent further brain damage due to hypoxia. You're preventing further brain damage to hypoxia. You're preventing further damage to the lungs for aspiration pneumonia. You are, that's why you're protecting the airway and you need a proper ventilation. You must put the patient maybe on a volume control for proper oxygenating to the brain. Because if a patient is not is breathing well, but the oxygen not going to the brain, he has further hypoxia, further areas of brain damage. And where the patient could have been saved, he dies. Cautiously lower blood pressure. The, uh, this less than 130, the, that is the mean arterial pressure but avoid excessive hypertension. It's, it's, it's very important that you cautiously know the blood pressure because if you do a very high degree of hypertension, what happens is then that the cerebral circulation, if it falls below a certain level, oxygenation to the brain will fall. So you just can't below, lower the blood pressure according to your will. You should keep a mean arterial pressure of 130. Okay. Rapidly stabilize vital signs and simultaneously acquire emergent CT scan. Maintain u volume using normotic rather than hypotonic fluids and avoid hypothermia. Uh, don't let the patient uh, overheat and facilitate transfer to the operating room or ICU. And by this time, you should know whether the patient needs to be managed conservatively or the patient needs to be surgery. And then according to that, you take the patient to the operating room or ICU. Management, decrease cerebral edema. How do you do it? What are the various measures of decreasing cell edema. Modest passive hyperventilation to reduce PSO2. CO2, you know, if there is a hyperventilation, if there is CO2 washout, there is vasoconstriction in the brain. Whenever there is a rise of CO2 in the blood, there is vasodilatation. So if there is moderate amount of vasoconstriction, it lowers the brain pressure. Because the brain pressure is a pressure combined of the brain parenchyma the CSF and the blood. So if there is a large hematoma in the brain, so the pressure will increase. So if there is hematoma, the only way you can lower the pressure is you can lower by actually maybe lowering the amount of blood that is going. You do a, a hyperventilate, the CO2 washes out and there is a vasoconstriction. Uh, the other important medication we give very often is mannitol, which is given at the dose of 0.5 to 1 grams per kg. It's a, basically a uh, is a carbohydrate. So mannitol, the most important function of mannitol is that it actually causes the osmotic gradient between the vascular blood vessels and the brain parenchyma. So because of the gradient being higher in the blood vessels, it draws in fluid from the brain because of the osmotic gradient and it tries to draw in more fluid from the brain. But that is not its only function. The other functions is that because it lowers the viscosity of blood, because it draws in more fluid, the blood actually can go to the nooks and corners of the brain and there's better oxygenation. And the third important is it has some antioxidant effect. So mannitol lowers brain edema by 
drawing in uh, fluid from the edematous brain inside the blood vessels. By drawing in more fluid, actually it lowers the blood viscosity, so the blood can flow to the nooks and corners of the brain and there's better oxygenation, that, so that part of the brain doesn't die. And it has some antioxidant effect. It protects the brain. It's called a brain protectant. We also give uh, Lasix, but that's not given. Elevate head 20 to 30 degrees. So whenever you elevate the head, there is a better venous drainage. So venous, venous drainage, and the brain edema tries to fall. Sedate and paralyze if necessary, if it's necessary, because if you sedate the patient, the chances of any epilepsy happening, any convulsion happening is low. Any convulsive, any features of convulsion can actually potentially raise the ICP suddenly. If there's a convulsion in the brain, it can raise the ICP to a certain extent that it can cause an herniation. So hyperventilate, mannitol, elevate the head, and sedate. And the most important, obviously, if there's a large trauma, large bleed, you have to go for the operation. These are ways to manage, as I told earlier, the whole gamut of neurosurgery head trauma is to prevent increasing pressure. It's not that you take out the blood completely. You have to decrease the pressure, prevent the vital structure that the brainstem from herniating. You should prevent the vital structure from being compressed and you should get the pressure down to whatever pressure, like 15, 20 milliliters of mercury, you should put it down. You can't allow the brain pressure to go up because there's no way the brain pressure can go out. There's a rigid skull outside. So the brain pressure will go inside. It will compress each other. It will compress the brain stem and the patient will kill you. It will kill you. It's not like the bleeding in the stomach because where the stomach can distend. Here, the bleeding inside the brain will only create further increase in pressure inside. And outside, there's no way the patient can go because there's a rigid skull outside. So that's why it is so important that you understand how quickly you should lower the ICP, either through medication, either through uh, changes in the body posture, raising the head, or you need a, in fact, you need all of three. You need medication, you need surgery, if surgery is warranted, and you need the posture changes to prevent ICP. So these are the various methods to prevent raise in ICP. And once the ICP is controlled, you can well be certain that the patient might be, might be saved. If you can't control the ICP, if there's a herniation, if there's secondary brain damage, then, then you lose the patient. That is the most important thing in a head injury patient, that you have to control the ICP because the head is inside a rigid skull and the pressure has no other place to go but to go and cause further pressure inside the brain itself. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Uh, there's a question, when is mannitol given in head injury? We, uh, in head injury, we give mannitol, especially in there is uh, diffuse injuries, we give mannitol. We give uh, mannitol when there is... Uh, uh, but also in subdurals and epidurals, whenever we think there's a raised ICP, whenever there is a raised ICP, we believe we can give mannitol. But the problem with mannitol is that you can't give mannitol for very long. As I told, mannitol actually is a sugar which causes raised osmotic pressure inside the blood and draws in fluid from the brain. But after two or three days, what happens? This mannitol starts going inside the brain. So it causes a reverse osmosis. Now the fluid which was supposed to come from the brain inside to the uh, blood to be uh, let out in, uh, in, in urination, the mannitol seeps inside the brain and draws in fluid from the blood itself in the system. So never give mannitol for more than two or three days because mannitol then starts going inside the brain. Give it early, give it maybe in short boluses of uh, two or three doses for two or three days and then stop and see the monitor. But giving mannitol for longer than three or four days causes more harm than good. And you should be also very, very careful, careful in giving mannitol with people with hypertension because with a high degree of uh, blood uh, fluid in the blood, it causes hypertension. It causes uh, cardiac anomalies if the patient has cardiac issues. And uh, people have um, many, uh, acute renal failure, it causes direct damage to the renal tubules. So one should be very careful when to give mannitol. But overall, mannitol is a fantastic medication to give a temporary relief to reduce ICP. But as I told, it is just not mannitol. It is hyperventilation, it is intubation, it is uh, posture change, it is um, hypothermia, and everything actually are used to reduce ICP. And when nothing can be done, we go for what is called a decompressive clinic. We take out flaps from two sides, we take out the skull bone from two sides, so let the brain parenchyma to, uh, to, to actually move out and then rather than compressing inside. The whole idea of controlling ICP is to prevent damage to the brain stem. Once the brain stem is damaged, 
once the initial all the in, all the five or six reflexes starts getting affected then you lose the patient you can you can have a lot of damage to the brain but you should prevent the brain stem from being damaged and that will invariably happen if you don't lower the pressure because ultimately because it being the most central part of the brain and there's a lot of pressure all around if it can't go outside or if it can't be controlled it will actually control and compress the brain stem if there's a brain stem compression then there's what is called a brain death and then you have, you you cannot save the patient and surgical i think uh, no surgical intervention if collection is less than 10 it's it's discretion of the surgeon when you do surgery but obviously uh, please remember that if there is a collection of more than 30 ml of blood if there is a midline shift if the brain uh, brain shifts from one side to the other for more than 5 mm in a ct scan we can see the shift of the brain from the uh, it is measured on the direction of the septum pellucidum and if the shifting is more than 5 mm and if the blood is more than 30 ml then we suggest that this patient needs some form of surgery some of form of surgery all right and the gcs score decreases by 2 so these are the various uh, indications where we do surgery in subdural hematoma with gcs 15 hematoma more than 10 or more than 5 mm midline shift requires surgical decompression and sh when a cerebral aneurysm is identified or angiography clipping and coiling is done to prevent bleed management surgical so basically the types of uh, surgeries we do in head injuries are bar holes where we do two bar holes one on the frontal and one on the parietal when the we know the underlying uh, blood is fluid like a subdural hematoma is totally fluid and then we just suck out the blood Uh, mm-hmm. the fluid blood and then close a craniotomy is a bone flap which is uh, temporarily removed from the skull to access the brain and a craniotomy is similar to a craniotomy but when you don't put the bone flap back maybe there's a massive injury to the brain and you have to take out the part of the skull but if you want to push the bone flap back again it will increase the pressure on in those times what we call we do a decompressive craniotomy we take out the bone flap we take out the bone flap and throw it away or we keep it inside uh, our abdomen in the tissues of the abdomen or we keep it in the fridge and, and later when the brain relaxes maybe after two or three weeks we put it back that's called a cranioplasty so bar holes are small holes where we take out fluid liquid blood a craniotomy is where you take out a bone flap do the surgery and you find the brain relax you put the bone flap back a craniectomy is when you take a craniotomy but you can't put the bone flap back because the brain is still very edematous very very uh, uh, tense then you put it and the last is that when you and the last thing is the craniopathy when you take the bone flap keep it inside the, the human body maybe in abdominal uh, subcutaneous pouch or in the uh, in in your in your in your, your ot and you, then you put it back after two or three weeks or maybe in a couple of months as called a craniopathy craniopathy is any procedure where you put a bone flap or an artificial uh, maybe a titanium mesh or a cage in to cover the bony gap in the skull all right is that correct is it clear what sir yes, difference sir. between craniectomy and craniplasty sir plasty we will keep it back craniectomy we won't keep it back sir no craniectomy is when you don't put the bone flap back in immediately after the operation okay and craniplasty is something when you put that bone back after a time interval So what can happen? You can do a craniotomy. You take the bone flap and you put it back. That's called a craniotomy. You take the bone flap out and you don't replace it. That's called a craniectomy. When you take this bone after three weeks and put it back again in the skull when the brain is relaxed, that's called a craniopathy. All right. So a craniopathy is nothing but an extension of craniectomy where the bone flap was not replaced, but after two or three weeks, either your autologous bone, the bone that was of the patient concerned, or some artificial material in the form of titanium is replaced to cover the gap of the skull when the patient's brain has uh, decreased in edema and pressure that is called a craniopathy it is never done in the same setting so you can do a bar hole you can do a craniotomy you can do a craniectomy but craniopathy is always done maybe 2 3 4 weeks later when the brain relaxes is that clear yes sir so indications of yes. bar hole indications of bar yes ask me please indications of bar hole sir bar hole sir sir indications of bar hole is that when the blood in the brain when the subdural blood as i told you is absolutely liquid if you do uh, if you see the ct scan i find that the 
it is a hypodense it, the, you understand the blood is no longer clotted it is not like a jelly it is not like a thick curd it is totally liquefied it is basically a liquid very liquid blood the blood basically what we call uh, just like serum where the, all the protein has actually gone and only serum part is there uh, is hypodense you just put two bottles and the blood can be just come out. you, you can just suck out that it is because it is fluid but if the blood is clotted, if the blood cannot, cannot come out from a single hole, then what you do is you take out a huge flap, you take out the Kurdish blood, which is still clotted, where the blood is subacute or it is acute, and that is called a craniectomy. But when in a subral hematoma, the blood is fluid, the blood is just like water, it is totally liquefied, just a single hole and the blood rushes out. It's a simpler surgery, it's a smaller surgery, and it can be done very effectively. So that is the indication of bar holes. And the other thing is bar is that when you do a craniotomy also, you have to do bar holes to connect the points to do a craniotomy. So that is also indication. You can do a bar hole just to take out the blood or you have to do three or four bar holes in the brain and then you connect the four bar holes and take out the flap. That is also indication. So bar holes are the fundamental surgery in the brain. You do a hole in the skull and or you do several holes in the skull, then you join the holes by a cutter and then take out the flap. That is called a craniotomy. Or a craniotomy. Okay. Sir, uh, and, uh, uh, yes. while, doing, while doing all these surgeries, we are only dealing with decompression of brain. Do we need to control the hemorrhage also? Of course, of course. That is the most important. The, the whole uh, dictum of brain surgery is that the hemorrhage is, uh, the brain is very edematous. The brain is very edematous and the blood vessels are bleeding all over. So on, on one hand, you should control the brain pressure. On the other hand, you have to control the brain bleeding. The only thing that is important in brain is controlling pressure and preventing further bleeding. And unlike in other part of the body, you can't press on anything. In, 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 if there is a long bone fracture, you can actually press the tissue on the bone. Or even in the abdominal, abdominal injuries, you can actually, actually squeeze that part. But in the brain, you can't squeeze the brain onto anything because that will cause further damage. So we use a very special type of pottery called a bipolar pottery, where we try to hold like twitches, the two vessels and we burn it. So Bleeding is very, very, the most important catastrophe in the brain surgery is bleeding, which is very difficult to control at times and to reduce the pressure. So on, on one hand, there is increased pressure, the brain is edematous and, and the blood vessels starts bursting everywhere. Uh, there are procedures, there are mechanisms by which we control. Then we take some time <coughs> when we find that the bleeding has stopped and the edema is not getting any back, then we close. Uh, if this uh, brain has swollen too much, then we throw the bone flap out. But if the brain is not swollen, then we put the bone flap. So we do a craniotomy or a craniectomy. Okay. So, and the other management, obviously, the ones you know is that we should always give antihypertensives uh, if there is bleeding and anticonvulsants uh, reduce frequency of seizures. So, always uh, give uh, some form of anti epileptic. The ones we commonly use are the ones which is called the uh, uh, phenytoin uh, group of uh, medications. Or we use other antihypertensives, and you should give antipyretics to prevent fever. And uh, you can give vitamin K, K and FFP if, obviously, if there is um, chances of bleeding. So these are things that you should be very careful after the surgery. That is the patient getting adequate antihypertensives so that the patient doesn't go into some form of repeat hemorrhage or encephalopathy. And uh, mannitol to reduce the pressure in the operated brain. Anticonvulsants to prevent seizures because. The blood in the blood in the brain from the contains iron, and the iron is very very epileptogenic. Very epileptogenic. Whenever there's a bleeding in the brain, it causes seizures. Why? Because the iron inside the blood in the hemoglobin is very epileptogenic. It causes seizures. So you should give some anti-epileptic measures like a, a phenytoin or um, uh, nowadays we use the word levaseratum, uh, levipil or valproic acid or carbamazepine, but the common ones you use are delant and that is phenytoin. If you think there is a degree of bleeding, you should give vitamin K or the fresh frozen plasma or warfarin uh, should be given. And antacids, as I told, prophylaxis for uh, Cushing's gastric ulcer and glucocorticoids may help reduce. But one thing, please remember that steroids have no role in head injury. Steroids have absolutely no role in head injury. Steroids have good role in brain tumors. Steroids have good role in brain tumors, but as far as head injury is concerned, all multi-randomized control trials have proved beyond doubt that steroids have no role. Rather, they have deleterious effect. If you give a lot of steroids, it causes immunosuppression. 
This causes a lot of infection. It causes a lot of ulcers. It causes a lot of bleeding. So never give steroids as an indication to prevent further um, deterioration. You can give steroids if the patient needs it, obviously. But you can't. Steroids have no role in head injury. That's a single one-liner. It has no role in the management of head injury, but it has role in the management of brain tumors. It has a role in the management of spinal tumors. For head injury, steroids have no role. That's that's as simple as that. It has no role. If anyone tells you, you just tell categorically that all studies have proven that steroids have no role. So there's no use giving steroids. And preventive measures, obviously, you are... Uh, you know better than me, uh, to prevent uh, car and motorcycle accidents, to wear safety helmets, obviously. Uh, that's a more social issue. That's more an issue of uh, actually people being conscious about it, but um, it, it's, it's not in our hands really, but obviously uh, prevention is better than cure and rehabilitation. Ambulatory and home care uh, is important because these head injury patients, you know, um, they need a lot of rehabilitation. Their functions sometimes don't come back maybe even after six months. Many of them are, uh, uh, have hemiparesis or paralysis. Many of them have cognitive functions. So you, you need a lot of support. You can't keep these patients uh, for uh, absolutely um, time immemorial in the hospital. You have to send them home. So you should see whether the patient going home is he having a proper nutrition, bowel and bladder management, because these are the source of infection. Spasticity, as I told, as it affects the brain, the muscles get very spastic. So uh, if you if if you if you cannot control the spasticity, that will be permanent. Even if the person ultimately starts to move, he can't move because the legs are spastic, the arms are spastic. So you should go for a physiotherapy prevent spasticity by medications. Um, we give uh, antispastic medications, but the most important is proper physiotherapy to keep the limbs in movement because there's a tendency for the limbs to become spastic, and they are permanent. And maybe the patient is too totally conscious, maybe after one, uh, six or seven months, but he can't move because his legs are spastic. It happens very often, dysphagia, difficulty in uh, uh, eating. So this is very important. You should be very careful that uh, the amount of food you're giving, whether it's actually, uh, and at times you can actually go and feed the patient for a long time on rice stew, or you can go for a peg and then start feeding the patient later. Caesar disorders are common, and um, obviously family participation and education to give support to say injury patients. Because most patients in injury are uh, young patients, um, they're in the prime of life, uh, and they don't know what has happened. The family is unsure what has happened. But as I told you, a great surgery, a great work in the hospital is zero if you don't see to the minor small things like prevention of bed sore, prevention of deep vein thrombosis, prevention of chest infection, proper nutrition, prevention of spastic. These things are very important. This is the holistic approach to head injury because. Uh, it is just not enough to do a proper surgery because uh, proper surgeries uh, do only part of the work. They may be life-saving, but if you want to keep that patient back in the society at some juncture, these small things are extremely important. These things uh, uh, do not need any heroism. They do, they do not need a lot of uh, I want, uh, skill. You, you just should, should be aware that whether the legs are getting swollen, whether the beds are developing, whether the chest is getting infected, whether the patient is getting problems. This is a small thing. You should check every day. And these things can be seen very easily. And that makes all the difference between you saving the patient and you not saving the patient. You don't see the small things when the patient dies. Okay. So I think uh, this is uh, what I tried to explain to you. Uh, any questions? Uh, I think it was a uh, quite a big topic. I just wanted to give you in a nutshell about uh, head injuries and uh, how... The role of heptoin in medical treatment, sir, in this hemorrhage? Role of? Role of? Can you to insert heptoin? Yeah, role of heptoin is that basically I told you that uh, whenever there's a bleeding inside the brain or there is a trauma inside the brain, you know, the brain has various areas which is called eloquent areas of the brain, like the uh, frontal uh, cortex. Uh, there's the part of the brain in front of the uh, in, in central sulcus, which is the motor cortex. Eh? is the motor cortex. So if there is bleeding in the motor cortex, if there is a irritation motor cortex, it leads to epileptic seizures. It leads to seizures. Like... Uh, so when you give eptoin, we actually help in preventing a seizure. If there's a seizure in the brain, in already a, a hypoxic brain, if there's further seizure, it causes in further edema and it can uh, deteriorate the patient. In a patient who is already comatose, if there's a conversion, it causes further uh, edema in the brain and the patient can become. So we should give in some form of anti uh, 
epileptic measures to prevent uh, fit, prevent an epilepsy, right? prevent epilepsy. Sir, what is the dose and how many days should we give Aptoin, sir? The dose is actually, uh, we normally give about for a 70 kg person, we give about 300 milligrams. That is about uh, around, around about 5 milligrams per kg body weight. So uh, initially, if there is a, what is called, um, if there is a status epilepticus, you should go, you, you should go for uh, about, you can go up to a 1000 milligram uh, uh, dose in over 15, 20 minutes, to 15, 20 minutes. And then you should give a, a, a standing dose about, about uh, five million per kg body weight for the next 24 hours or 48 hours. This is the dose where you give for a status epilepticus. But normally, even if there is no uh, status, you should start the dose at about five milligram per kg body weight. Uh, that comes to about 100 milligrams per, uh, per oral dose. For So about 300 milligrams of uh, uh, epton per day is sufficient to prevent epileptic fits in a normal adult. Okay, normal adult. Uh, sir, is there any uh, specific criteria to take CT, sir? How uh, pediatric uh, patients uh, CT criteria are anything? CT? Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, there, there's a lot of... Uh, any, 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 any patient any patient who has a head injury with a loss of consciousness, consciousness, any patient who has head injury with a skull bone fracture, or any patient who has head injury with a coma scale is just even one below 15 uh, CT scan is advocated. So if there is a history of a patient comes to you with a coma scale of 15, but he had a history of LOC, you go for a CT. If you think that in the skull bone, there's a fracture, the patient is completely fine, you go for a CT. If you find he is slightly confused, but nearly okay, then also you go for a CT. Only when a patient comes with no loss of consciousness, no mm -hmm. fracture and the coma scale is 15, you may you may avoid the CT, but even if so that is the CT, that's fine. Hello. Uh, is this criteria is same for pediatric? Hello. In 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 pediatric in pediatric we don't do a CT that quickly because the CT is a radiation which can harm the brain, you know, which can harm the brain. In a pediatric we sometimes go in what is called for ultrasonography, USG. And sometimes we go for MRI. In a pediatric, we don't go to a CT that often because a CT scan has a very high radiation dose. But yeah, the criteria is more or less the same. If the child has a coma scale below uh, 15, is a fracture, if the child has a loss of consciousness, you should go for a CT. You should go for a CT, but you should be very careful in a CT in a child because of the high radiation on a developing brain. Sir, sir fixed, fixed gauge, and uh, uh, fixed gauge is suggestive of the third nerve palsy and also the uh, dilated fixed pupil. No, dilated fixed pupil, you see the pupil uh, constricts because of the two things. No, there's the open motor nerve, you know, open motor nerve. Open motor nerve is the one actually that uh, it, uh, it constricts the pupil. So if there's a third nerve palsy, if the open motor nerve is not working, then there is no way the pupil can constrict. So the pupil remains dilated. So that is basically a feature of third nerve palsy. So whenever put whenever put light on the eyes, the pupils constrict because that is the way it. The third nerve constricts the pupil, but if the third and nerve why, is not why deviated gaze. Deviated gaze happens on two things. That's because of the ocular cephalic. If there is a tumor on part of the brain, if there's a tumor on this part of the brain on the right side the gaze is found to be deviated to the left. And if there is a seizure on that side of the brain, if there's a, if there's a seizure on the right, if, there, if there's an epileptic fit on the right side, if the point, the gaze is deviated to the side of the fit. If there is a trauma or a tumor on the right side, the gaze will deviate on the left. So that's the way the ocular cephalic reflexes work. And if there is a seizure, there's no trauma, there's no injury to the brain, but there's an epileptic fit, the brain gaze will deviate towards the side of the fit. And in the other case, it will fit in case of trauma or an ice age, it will fit to the other side. That's the way it happens. Sir, in uh, GCS score, can you please explain about that verbal response, that bit, uh, difference between the incomprehensible, inappropriate and confused words? Sir? Yes, yes, yes. So okay. it's very important. So V1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so this 5. So when a person is in V5, the person is... Uh, I'll give an example. What is your name? He tells your name. He is he is telling the right answers and he is 
oriented to time and space. He knows where he is, what time of day it is, uh, what. Uh, he, so it is not only speaking the correct words, but it's oriented to time and space. That is V five. In V four, the patient knows his name. The patient knows who's his son's name. The patient is not oriented to time and space. He doesn't know that this is the daytime or this is the nighttime, and he doesn't know. Or whether he is in hospital or in the room. That is the only difference between V4 and V5. In V3, he says a few words like, uh, I'm getting hurt. He's saying a few words. Words are coming out. Words are coming out. Words are coming out. That is V3. In V2, no words are coming out. It sounds, sounds like he's making, oof, ah, that is V2. And V1, there is no response. So V1, no response. V2, sounds, only sounds, no specific words. V3 specific few words. V4 is speaking quite well, but not oriented to space and time. And V5 is speaking perfect like you and me. He knows what is his name. He knows what is his father's name. He knows this is night. He knows he is in Calcutta. He knows this. He had an accident. So he's totally oriented to space and time. That is the verbal response to the Glasgow Coma skill. All right, sir. Sir, if sir, if GCS less than six, is it contraindication of the bar rule? As some no, no, symptoms no, no, no. usually practice. No, no, no. If if the GCS is three, if the GCS is three, sometimes we don't go for operation. But if the GCS is less than six, C, that is a discretion of the surgeon or the doctor. If the GCS is less than six, if the pupils are dilated, then actually there are a lot of criteria to do an operation or not. But a GCS less than six is not a contraindication to bar an operation. But a GCS which is three, where the pupils are dilated and the coma scale is three. Normally in centers all over the world we don't operate with the GCS because we are, it has been seen that the prognosis is absolutely uh, it it is not it is it is equally bad but GCS six no not in our centers we in GCS six you can make an attempt but you have to tell the patient relative that the prognosis is very bad that we are making an attempt that's it that's important sir is coma and that vegetative state state is same mm. sir you no no no. Uh, basically, uh, we don't use the word coma. It is a it basically uh, a vegetative state is a person where the cerebral cortex are not functioning properly. That is a form of coma where the cognitive functions are lost, but the brainstem functions are intact. So his pupils are reacting, his ocular cap, he's breathing, he's swallowing. So that is a state of vegetative state. In a coma, the patient is basically unconscious, where uh, maybe uh, his uh, cortex is functioning or not functioning, the eyes are closed, he is not responding in any way, he is in a coma actually. But in a vegetative state, it is uh, very broad actually, but the patient is actually looking at you, he is not having what is called a, a purposeful look, but he is hearing and he is actually staring, that is a vegetative state. In a coma, the patient is unconscious, the reticular attaching system, the part of the brainstem which controls our consciousness, our waking, awake, that part is affected. The patient is actually sleeping. De depending on the depth of the coma, you can say whether he is in GCS uh, 13, 14 or he is in GCS uh, 3. So that is coma where the RAS reticular attaching system is affected and the patient is in some form of deep sleep. In a very state, the patient is not sleeping, but the patient is not aware also because it's uh, no functions are working, but he's alive, he's breathing, he's, uh, he's, he's swallowing, he's actually looking at you, his pupils are reacting, that's a vegetative state. Sir, can we get a GCS of E1, M5 like that, or E2, M5 in... See, 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 actually, see, actually, the GCS uh, doesn't work that way. When I, E1 and M5 and V5 doesn't work because it, it is uh, functions like it's very rare to find GCS of E1 and V5 and M6. It doesn't happen that way. When the whole, you know what I mean? So when the brain functions yes, going sir. on, everything goes down. Yes, but there are certain conditions where the GCS can't be seen. Like if a patient has a tracheostomy, you can't see the verbal response. So what we do is that we put E4, VT, M5. So VT means verbal is tracheostomy. Is done. Or sir. if there is a lot, or, or if there's a lot of edema in the eyes and the patient can't open his eyes. So you can't do a proper GCS there. So there are certain indications where GCS can't, but a patient with an E1 and V5 and M6, it doesn't happen. Very good question because the cognitive function of the brain doesn't affect only the verbal or the motor. It also affects the eyes. So if the GCS is good, all the parameters are nearly good. 
it's just as bad all the parameters are bad but we do have patients which is e2 v2 m5 the motor is the most important we do have patients where patient has e2 v2 m5 we have but e1 v1 and then m6 it doesn't happen that way it doesn't happen yeah sir if the patient has like raccoon eyes and he can't open his eyes then how do you mm. score the e score we don't we don't put the e score we don't put the e score there we put uh, e is not put the we only put the score according to the verbal response and the and the, the sir and the motor any other score apart from the gcs used in the neurosurgery any other score no we don't we know we know all the other scores have been uh, put into trash we don't put any other score there a lot of scores are here Uh, but none of the scores are given importance. The only score that is important all worldwide is the Glasgow Commerce because of the simplicity and because of its authenticity. It's very simple and very authentic. And um, uh, the Glasgow Commerce scale doesn't see the brainstem reflex; it just sees the level of consciousness. There were a lot of other scores, a lot of other scores, very complex scores were done, but it is no longer used nowadays. No longer used nowadays. Sir, about the sir, in paralytic patients, how to check for motor response? Sir, you told to open the tongue to show the tongue. But uh, mm. M4, M5, there is decerebrality, decorticate, all these things. How mm. can we tell that? No, actually, decorticate, rigidity, and decerebrality are the terms which are earlier used for motor response. Like I'll tell you, motor response is that you ask the patient to show his tongue, obeying a command. If he obeys a command, if he obeys a command, that is M6. Any command he obeys. maybe he might be paralyzed from his uh, legs he can't open it is it is not a function of the motor function it is a consciousness of his motor m5 is localizing you you give a hard pinch on his chest and his hand comes towards the hand try to remove it that's m5 he is localizing to the point of irritation m4 is that you pinch the person and is trying to go away from you that is called withdrawal m3 is basically what is called decorticate he is trying to basically is trying to basically trying to uh, abnormal flexion that's called the and m2 is abnormal expansion so decortication and decerebration are actually m3 and m2 but no noun is m3 means abnormal flexion and m2 means abnormal expansion so decerebrate is when the patient is abnormally uh, extending that's decerebrate but we that is actually m2 and m3 is decortication where the brain stem is still functioning and the patient is trying to uh, flex that is called m3 so m6 m5 m4 m3 m2 m1 forget the other things decortication decerebrations were terms used before the age of the uh, age of the glasgow comma skill nowadays we use only the terms of uh, Basically, obeying commands, localizing, withdrawing, abnormal flexion, abnormal extension, and no movement. All right. Sir, where do we measure the CS of glucose in brain trauma? Hello. Hello, sir. Where do we you. measure? Uh, how do we measure and when to measure the CS of glucose? You in head measure trauma? the CS of glucose in. We don't measure the CS of glucose in head trauma. Actually, we only measure the beta transferrin. But CSF glucose is measured when we think there's some form of meningitis. Okay. Uh, in case of viral meningitis, in case of bacterial meningitis, in viral meningitis the glucose doesn't go down much, but in bacterial meningitis the glucose goes down, the protein goes up, and that is measured in the in the pathology. Pathology. We take the CSF and there's measure. There's ways to measure the glucose. So in viral meningitis, just remember the protein doesn't change much. The glucose doesn't change much. That's a viral meningitis. In in a condition of Guillain-Barré syndrome, the protein goes up very high. In bacterial meningitis, the protein goes up and the glucose goes down. And that by seeing the various parameters of glucose uh, and protein and cells, we can uh, from the CSA we can understand what condition. But in head injury, glucose is not measured. We only measure the beta to transferrin to know whether the CSA is coming out or not. Okay, CSA is coming. Sir, in pre-operative, uh, pre-hospital care, you said uh, never suction, never do suction orally. Sir, uh, is it for all the cases of head injury, or where we suspect CSF uh, leak, there we uh, avoid uh, oral suction? Yeah, good question. Where we suspect CSF leak, uh, don't do oral suction. But even if you don't suspect, if you have any doubt, then do don't do oral suction. But uh, if even if you have a doubt, then don't do oral suction because you know when you are putting that oral suction through your mouth. 
is quite chance that instead of going inside your pharynx inside the trachea it can take a path inside the brain you know there's going to be a fracture at the base of the skull so if you have any doubt ask anesthetist to come and ask him to see a laryngoscope and see it properly and then do an oral suction don't what i meant was don't do it blindly if you have any doubt don't do it blindly even if you don't doubt don't do it ask someone ask a senior ask a anesthetist to open the mouth to see whether the blood whether csf is coming whether there is any injury to the base of the skull and then under laryngoscopic guidance if you need to put a suction or a rail strip we just put it down you can do that that way just to be careful that it doesn't go inside the brain that can be catastrophic that's the reason sir in craniectomy do we call it uh, decompressive craniotomy also or it's a misnomer no decompressive de uh, uh, craniotomy as i told is uh, just taking out the bone flap doing a tumor operation or uh, taking out the blood clot and putting the bone flap back that's called a craniotomy in decompressive craniotomy it is basically a uh, operation to prevent very high icp when all other measures are failed all the measures of uh, like hyperventilation manitol posturing ventilation has failed we take out large flaps maybe there's a large flap uh, and the flap measurement is 15 by 12 cm so the anterior posterior uh, diameter of the flap is 15 and the top to down diameter is about 12 and that huge flap is taken from the frontal parietal and region of the bone is taken out the dura is cut in a criss cross manner maybe you do nothing in the brain the brain just pulsates and then you don't take the flap you just put the skin back skull back you take the bone flap keep it in the abdomen or keep it in the fridge or in or in, in, in nowadays in, in 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 england and other parts they just throw the flap and after some time when maybe two or three weeks the brain settles down and the edema settles down and there is a gap in the brain where actually the skin is some bound to be going inside you go to what is called a 3d ct reconstruction and you do an exactly titanium bone flap you model it out from the gap in the bone and you take out the skin again and put the titanium bone material at the level of the bone gap and fix it with screws over the bone that is called a craniosynoplasty okay so that's called a craniosynoplasty so basically uh, you uh, decompress the craniectomy is basically when you decompress the brain by a craniectomy and don't put the bone flap back is a life saving measure for large infarctions bad head injuries where there's no other way you can control the blood pressure in the brain and you actually have to take out part of the skull to prevent to let the brain expand outside that's called decompressive craniectomy and the sizes are anterior posterior is about 15 cm and top to down is 12 you should be a large flap and um, then patient is on ventilator we two or three weeks later when the patient settles down if the patient survives you put the bone flap back or you put an artificial material that's called decompressive craniectomy and the consequent uh, craniosynoplasty so I, I, i want to ask you sir like uh, decompressive craniotomy it is normal craniotomy craniotomy crani craniotomy decompressive not craniotomy decompressive craniotomy always because you never put the bone flap back then it's a craniotomy thank you sir another indication for uh, surgical decompression or surgical management in yeah. subdural hematoma sir you said hematoma more than 10 mm this 10 mm yeah. is like the cc or the volume or the length or breadth sir no no 10 mm is there there's there's, 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 there's normally uh, non it is there is a uh, uh, ways in the ct scan where they can actually measure the ml but normally what we do is we measure it by the anterior posterior the depth and the length we find out from just measuring it by tape actually uh, it is the total volume the total volume of the blood and if you want me to ask how do it uh, actually they are, are in the modern uh, ct scan computers they just uh, strike on there and they can tell you the amount of blood that, that is uh, collected but even with a ct scan uh, you can use simple measures to see the coronals and the sagittal and the axial cut and you can measure and you can get a rough idea of amount of blood there so it is not 10 ml if if it is less than 10 we don't operate but normally what mm, mm sir it, on the slide it was given like midline shift more than 5 mm or yes 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 uh, uh, subdural hematoma more than 10 mm so yeah. it is so it's not 10 mm no sir or 
Yes, no, not ml, not that. ml. It's, it's a volume, 10 ml, ml, cc, cc, ML. not ml. Still, it's, okay. it is it is a volume of, I'm, I'm sorry, it is not the millimeter. The shift is in millimeters and the amount of uh, subdural is in ml or cc, you know, cc, cc. So, sir, SDH more than 10 cc is indication for decompression, sir, or the 30 ml is required for no, 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 no. If, if, if actually what I told was below 10, we never do. Be between 10 and 30 is a discretion of the doctor to do or not, depending on other parameters. If there's a shift. Okay, up. sir. But okay, if, sir. It, if it is above 30, then you do it actually. 30, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. 50, you do it. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Any questions? <laughs> Hello, sir. Yeah, so please. how much is the chances of recurrent bleeding if we just do a bar hole? And uh, extract the plant. Could, could you just uh, could you just place the question once more, please? Also, if we just do a burn hole surgery, so mm. how much is the chances of recurrent bleed in that case? Because we are not plotting the blood vessels of it. No, no, the chances of recurrence is always there in any form of brain surgery. But you should know that the indication of burn hole surgery is when the fluid inside the brain is totally liquid. Okay. The liquid. If, if, if you do a bar hole, you can never take out a chunk of blood from through a bar hole because if the blood is clotted, you know, any blood which clots, it forms like a jelly, like a curd. You can't take it out. When you know that in the CT scan, the blood is absolutely fluid, it is uh, it has become liquefied, the protein has subsided, it is just the serum, uh, then you can take it. And the chance of recurrence depends on uh, if the patient is uh, elderly, if the brain is already atrophic, if there's a gap, doesn't fill up then the chance of recurrence is high. It may be about 20-30% recurrence. But if the brain is a young patient's brain and the moment you take out the blood and the brain actually swells up to the surface of the bar hole, then the chance of recurrence is less. It all depends on the amount of uh, cerebral atrophy that has taken place, whether the patient is elderly. And obviously, recurrence also depends on whether the patient is on any blood thinners like uh, aspirin or warfarin. And if uh, the patient is elderly, if the patient has some diseases, the recurrences do go up. But normally, for normal subdural hematomas, there's a good chance of a recurrence of at least 15 to 20% people do come with a recurrence because the gap between the subdural space and the brain remains. It, the brain doesn't swell up, you know, and the gap, again, refills with blood. The whole idea is that if the brain is atrophic, then the gap doesn't fill up. If the brain is not atrophic, the moment you take out the blood, the brain springs back. It just swells up. You can see in the surgery, you can swells up to the undersurface of the dura. There's no gap between the dura and the brain. And so there's no chance of recurrence in that case. Okay. okay. Sir, in, sir, in such an atrophic brain who comes with a brain bleed, should hmm. we not give mannitol, sir? Because there's already space for the bleeding to occur. And if you give mannitol and shrink the brain more, will the bleeding increase? In such cases, is mannitol contraindicated? Yeah, but it's not a contraindicator. If, if there is a bleed in the brain and if you find there's no increase in pressure in the brain, if there's still atrophy, there's no indication of mannitol. Good question. Because the patient, if we give mannitol to reduce the ICP. If the brain is already atrophic and there is an ICH and the brain is not actually creating any pressure effect because the brain is atrophic, then giving mannitol will not be of benefit. Yes, in a way it might shrink further and it might cause further bleeding. Yeah, it's a good question. That's the discretion of the doctor. But if you find that the pressure is not raised even in spite of the bleed, don't give manito. Don't give manito. Sir, so without measuring the ICP or without doing a uh, ventricular catheter, we can't predict, no, sir, the ICP. ICP, uh, you cannot predict without uh, the... Uh, Monitoring. Uh, the modern IC measurements are uh, basically... Uh, um, we put a transducer in the brain parenchyma and we can measure the pressure. Without putting the pressure, you cannot actually... Uh, give a definite idea of uh, ICP, but if you see the CT scan in a raised ICP, if you see a CT scan, the salty gel in all the systems defect, you can't see the systems, all are compressed. Then okay. from a CT scan, you can get an idea that the ICP is raised. Yes, but the best measure is to put a bolt inside the brain and measure the ICP. And if it is more than 20, 25 millimeters of mercury, that is raised ICP. But other than that, from the clinical manifestations from the CT, we can give a rough idea that maybe the ICP is raised, but without the bolt, you can't. Without the ICP monitor, you can't give a definitive answer to a raised ICP. Good question. Good question. And sir, cisternostomy in raised ICP, sir, how often do you do it or is it useful? Cisternostomy? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, Sister Tommy, in a race recipe, we don't do it very often, but when we go in and do a decomposition craniectomy, then only, we don't do a Sister Tommy normally. But when we go inside the brain and do, a, when we do a decompression, then, then we go inside the cisterns and uh, bifurcate the cisterns to uh, let CSF flow out. That we do. But just doing a cisternostomy uh, is not effective. You have to go for a decompressive craniectomy. Then you should go to the cisterns and then you should bif dis dissect the cisterns to let further CSF flow out. Then we do it. Then we do it. But it's not very effective, not very effective because the systems are so compressed in a raised ICP that if you do a system of swimming, it doesn't bring in much because the, most of the CSF has been pushed out, you know, it's been pushed out because the brain is so uh, in, in such a high pressure. The, the CSF is pushed out. The ventricles are all squeezed. So where would you do the system of swimming? It's all squeezed. Yes, There's so much of brain that the CSF has flown out and is out, not in the brain anymore. So we don't routinely do it now, sir, right? In no, no, no. Craniectomy we do, and if if you think uh, sometimes we there's a place in the cistern a magna, it's a, a posterior part. There we try to uh, drain uh, CSF. Sometimes when we go for the cilian fissure, but routinely it's not done because in that high pressure it's very difficult actually to dissect a cistern. And even if you dissect a cistern, you know the in the cistern there are major blood vessels. You can injure the blood vessel. So uh, we don't do it because it's very compressed. What you can do. Control, you can do an EVD, you can do an external yeah. ventricular drain. You can put a, a drain inside the ventricle and that can come off. That can come off. That you can do. EVD. So the whole idea of reducing pressure is that you either lower the amount of CSF, lower the amount of blood, or you do take out the clot. Because the pressure in the brain is due to the brain parenchyma, the CSF, and the blood. So whenever there's a huge uh, compression, the CSF and the blood are squeezed already, isn't it? So what you can yes. do is that you can really only uh, operate on the skull, take out the skull and let the brain expand because there's very little CSF space anyway. It's all squeezed out, it's squeezed out. Okay, sir. thank you, sir. Okay, any other questions, anyone? Sir, any contraindications for giving mannitol, sir? Yeah, that's a good question. Contraindication for giving mannitol, obviously, is if, I, as I think I told you earlier, uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, when there is an epidural hematoma, we sometimes don't give mannitol because, you know, uh, what happens is that when the brain shrinks further, because the epidural hematoma is outside the brain, it's between the bone and the dura, there's a chance that the epidural hematoma might expand further. So sometimes we don't give in epidural hematoma. That is the contraindication. We don't give uh, mannitol in patients who are hypertensive, cardiac failures, because what mannitol does is that mannitol initially causes hypervolemia. So the patient can have uh, hyper, um, in cardiac issues, it can cause a lot of uh, cardiac problems. And in cases of renal failure, we don't give mannitol because it induces further renal failure. So in epidural hematomas is the neuro neurosurgical cause and systemic cause of patients who have high hypertension, who have uh, cardiac issues, because hypervolemia happens in them. And if there is issues of renal failure, uh, if the fluid cannot come out, because mannitol ultimately causes diuresis, it causes diuresis. And mannitol itself causes further damage to the renal tubules. So in kidney disease, in heart disease, in hypertension, normally we don't give mannitol, or we give mannitol extremely cautiously, very cautiously. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Anyone? Anything you want to, any doubts, you can clear it. Or we can clear doubts again when we have classes, uh, maybe on the fourth. All silent. Hello, sir. Yes. Can we, uh, sure. is there any imaging modality to diagnose diffuse axonal injury, sir? Good question. Uh, you, have, you have studied neuro. <laughs> yes. Uh, this MRI question, uh, this is uh, MRI features are there. In diffuse injury, as I told earlier, that if you see a CT scan and the normal CT scan is there and there is a, uh, the patient is deeply unconscious, then you should suspect uh, diffuse injury. And in that is one of the reasons and one of the few cases where an MRI is important in head injury. In others, in subdural, epidural, MRIs have no significance because you can see such well in a CT scan. In diffuse injury, uh, 
when you do an MRI, there are four, uh, there are three grades of diffuse injury. You can see uh, cortical changes in the brain uh, parenchyma. There is diffuse injury grade one. When the injury goes up to the corpus callosum, it's diffuse injury grade two. And if it goes up to the brain cell, so it is actually injury. If, if you see there is uh, single changes in the brain parenchyma only, there's diffuse injury grade one. If the injury is in the corpus callosum, it's up to grade two. And if there's injury to the brain stem. So there are three patients, all the CDs are normal. And then you do an MRI. The person with only injury to the parenchyma has an excellent prognosis. And the person with a brainstem injury has a bad prognosis. So that is the way you can differentiate in a head injury of patients with normal CT. And then you can do an MRI and say to the patient A, that he has a good chance because in the MRI it shows only parenchyma injury. To B, injury up to the corpus callosum, he has a he, is, he has also a fairly good chance. But if you see a patient has brainstem injury, he has a bad chance. But in the CT, none of them will show up and all will look the same. Very good question. So MRI is an indication, especially to evaluate diffuse injury because that cannot be seen in a CT scan. It can't be seen like an epidural hematoma or a subaural bleed or ICH. It looks a perfectly normal scan, but in MRI, you will get a perfectly abnormal MRI. You can see it. Okay. All right. Is that enough for the day today? Long class. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. Any other? Okay. I, I think uh, just uh, next class when we'll have. Uh, I think I think it's on the fourth. I think they have uh, scheduled me a class. We'll uh, we'll go over this head injury further. I'll bring in further scans. I'll show you all the type of scans and uh, all the smaller questions that can be asked. And you keep all your questions ready next week. And we'll discuss all the questions. Okay, all the any 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 confusion you have, any confusion you have, you just bring it up with me, and we'll decide. Okay, we'll discuss. Okay, thank you, students. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye.